Three, three, two, one, and we have a goal. And we got Gary right, Jones. Two, two, on, how many three, two, ones are we having? Are you Moved away from that mic now. How are you doing, dude? How are you doing? Gary right, Jones back in the studio. <laughs> gets mic on you. I'm good, mate. Having said that, when you relax, you're going to be booming through. You'll boom through. You wiggling something around different. No, it's right. I think you started. You started wiggling now as we moved. To, <laughs> put the mic on 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 for you, uh, mate. What's been going down? You you are having a busy time. Last time you were in was um, number one fifty eight. No, no, oh, that was the last time. Yeah, you yeah, were. approximately a year ago. We so think the first time was four years ago. Believe it or not. Nearly four years. 2018. 2019. 2019. Maths. 2019. Maths, yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 2019. What's going on? What have you been up to? Mate, good to uh, see you. Good to see you too, bro. Thank you. Thank you for having me back in. All right. Um, yeah, last time I think um, way too much coffee had been consumed. Oh. So, yeah. Well, I remember that. Whatever that stuff was. There were comments about that podcast. I mean, mate, I went, I'm sure there was, but we we went to um, Columbia straight after, and I don't think I found anything there that was as strong as that coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, if you if you remember, right, I think when you when we were talking before that podcast, you you had a, you were having a touch of insomnia at the time. You weren't sleeping very well, and you would that day you had got up at something like two p.m. and at the time I was stopping drinking coffee about ten a.m. normally. We started recording about four or five o'clock. I started drinking coffee that time, and we, we well, I started planning through it. You carried on drinking coffee, and then the evening came, which is where the brain gets active, yeah. you know, super like creative, and then <laughs> the rest is history. Well, I remember as well that last one we did. I think it was my first time out the house for a while, so because we because oh, it was right, yeah. uh, there was still all the restrictions was, yeah. and stuff going on. Um, so I've been in public the last week, so I've got a lot of speaking out of me, so I'm a bit more relaxed today, tranquilo. Mm. Did you, that event at uh, RGS with uh, Lev, etc., did you host that? Were you hosting that? Lev was, Lev was hosting, um, and then on the panel we had Sir Lolly Bristow, who was the ambassador, Her Majesty's ambassador to Afghanistan at the time of the uh, evacuation. We had uh, Johnny Mercer on there, who I know you've had on the podcast. Yeah. Sorry, I should say the right honourable Johnny Mercer, right the one who getting mad at me. Um, who else do we have on there? Zara Joya, um, who is a um, Afghan female journalist. Um, she was incredible. And Najma, she plays football for a. She played football for a, a, a female football team in Herat, which obviously put her uh, on the Taliban radar. Have I seen something about her getting a load of grief in the last 48 hours on Twitter? Really? I'm sure I said she... Oh, oh, no, 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 on Twitter. BBC did an article about it. Was it her? It was, it was definitely an Afghan footballer. It was a couple of... T- so there Maybe was the national There was the national team, which were very well publicised coming out, and then there was this girls team from Herat, um, and they're Hazaras, who were the most kind of like persecuted group under the Taliban. Um, so they... They kind of came out of there too. Uh, who else do we have on the panel? And then it was me. Yeah, uh, we had. Uh, um, I don't. I know he doesn't like publicity, so I won't say who. I won't give his name out. But he was um, uh, two parrot Aj at the time. Um, he, and he was on the panel. He was on the panel. But he doesn't like publicity. We we like. I, just, <laughs> I would. I think it's fair. So he's a mate of me and left. So we kind of okay, dragged. Yeah, yeah. We kind of dragged him into it. But um, yeah, he was he was dragged kicking and screaming. <laughs> Onto the panel. Um, so serving Adj? He's, he's not the Adj anymore, but he was the Adj at the time of the evacuation. Oh, interesting. When two para went out there. And then, yeah, me and Lev. Um, and uh, our friend Ash was the uh, MC. It was a great event, mate. Um, incredible to be a part of it. Um, as you can imagine, the the kind of the, the you know, the, the, every, every kind of panelist had a couple of questions each and you know, obviously the 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 two Afghan um, women, they really kind of like they they had incredibly powerful testimony from you know having actually been you know been you know out there with their lives threatened. And, and well, what's their take on what went down? I mean, it was a. They're almost this. I mean, they're so grateful to be alive and for the efforts of people to get them out and to help them set up in the UK. That they are very. Um, grateful to the British government, the British Armed Forces, etc. Um, and I suppose when somebody's kind of saved your life, in a sense, you're going to be grateful to them. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, and I, this is just my opinion, but it's almost like, you know, someone throws you in a swimming pool and then you thank them for pulling you out. 
almost, you know. Like, they should never have been in that position of having to have these kind of last-minute hair-raising escapes out of the country in the, in the first place, in my opinion. Um, but, yeah, so, and then, you know, Johnny Johnny was good on his answers. We I won't give specifics on any answers because we did kind of have a, a bit of a pact in the um, in the event that we wouldn't record anything and that we wouldn't really kind of... Um, you know, it was if you were there, you were there, and if you weren't, you weren't. So I'm not going to talk about what people's answers were or, or anything like that. But what I will say is that some of the stuff was incredibly moving. There was definitely some points where I thought I'm going to fucking tears are coming here. Um, but it, it was just great, mate. I mean, it, like I'm obviously always very proud to be a part of the British military. Always proud to be a British veteran. And um, you know what? Well, as much as the thing was a as a disaster in a lot of the sense, you know, it was um, it, it, from disasters come often the greatest acts of humanity, and I think that, you know there was a lot of that on display there, and it was great because a lot of the audience were um, we actually had a lot of audience there who were actually inkable at the time. We had people people from Two Para came, um, we had people from the RAF there who were part of the air crews. We had people there who were civvies working out there, either for the foreign, co uh, whatever it's called, is it foreign common, foreign commonwealth domestic office. Yeah, but it's, yes, got yeah. An, it's, got an, it's got an extra letter in there now, I think, um, just to confuse people. And then, um, <coughs> yeah, and then, so to, to kind of be able to meet this variety of people, because doing the book, we did a lot of interviews and I was able to get a lot of in-face interviews with the American side of things. Um, some of them in bars, which was my favourite kind of interview. No offence, <laughs> mate. Um, but, um, you know, we, we kind of had that going there. But, um, you know, it was just, it, it was kind of awesome to see as well. So many people came out with, more, more than 700 people, uh, you know, people coming out to to hear these stories. And, I, and, and, I, and I, I'm really happy that the, the girls football team that came along, that, you know, they, they got to show. Because, like, sometimes they would say, you know, they get shit for being... You know, for being here, for being immigrants, you know, they get shit from people and they get lumped in with the people that come here for the wrong reasons. And um, I think it was nice to be able to show them that, you know, actually a lot of us do give a fuck and we want to make them welcome. And we want, you know, look, they didn't leave their country because they wanted to. They left because they had to. And there's a real distinction to kind of be drawn there. But, mate, it was overall just a really good event. So, yeah, kudos for Lev and uh, his assistant, Evie, for, for putting that on because it was, it was absolutely brilliant, mate. Mm. So what's their situation now, the girls there? Living in hotels still, um, you know, but able to play football. Hopefully, you know, hopefully a start of a new life. But as you can imagine... They're here permanently now. I mean, yeah, they can't go back, can they? I mean, um, you know, it's um, it's just one of those where I think... Youth is on their side for the football team. You know, when you're that age, you know, 18, 19, I think you're very quite pliable. And, you know, hopefully by the time they hit their mid-20s, they'll become, you know, they'll be fully adjusted to the UK. They'll be set up. They'll have their own homes, you know, that kind of thing. But still a difficult period for them. I mean, it's, you know, we're only, what, 16 months on, kind of. Yeah, about 16, no, sorry, 18 months on, something like that from the events. That is flown by. Let me just it, give me it, one it, second. Yeah, yeah, this fucking mic, because for some reason, this is more last episode I can't I can hear you talking I can barely see you I can't see your beautiful face guys. Okay. right that was that that's fine yeah, okay. the, the mic plays but it's fine it's, oh, I, can, I can I can see, see you me. now look at that I can see you <laughs> well for me now this is a terrifying <laughs> ordeal so. um, 18 months ago that has that has flown by that has absolutely flown by and uh, and very quickly forgotten very quickly forgotten mm -hmm. I think by people in general um, which is not a good thing. There's definitely lessons to be learned there, for sure. Um, well, that, that's, I mean, that was one of the aims of the, the book, you know, because the night was launching the book, Escape from Kabul, available now. Um, but uh, on audiobook, e-book, and how back? Uh, hang on, who audiobooked it? Uh, our friend Ash. Me and Lev both. Oh, I know Ash. Yeah, I yeah, Ash, me, yeah. me and Lev both, well, we're not touching that with a fucking badge. But we both, we've both done audiobooks before. Um, I narrated Brothers in Arms, also available on audiobook, ebook, <laughs> <and Africa. laughs> um, but yeah, it was um, like because there's so many. Like, we drew upon we had US Marines, US soldiers, um, we had people from the RAF, people from Two Paro, uh, people from different regiments in the British Army, 
um, no Raf Raj in there. <laughs> um, but we had politicians, we had um, uh, obviously Afghans themselves who'd gone through the process of having to escape their homes. Um, and so uh, so the idea of doing an audio book where you've got all these people's different testimony in there, it was just, it just didn't feel right to do it, to be honest. So I've not read it right yet. It's an end-to-end -end account, is it, of what happened? I mean, the, the thing is, you can't really tell the account of what happened there without giving it some kind of context to set up why it happened, right? So there's a bit of that in there. Both both Lev and I are both uh, history majors. So it's kind of going back to the roots in a little bit. It's the first time, to be honest, I think I've used uh, my degree it's 20 years later. Hang on, you're both, what, history, history majors? History majors. I thought you said history makers. I mean, I that's a very grand title I mean, to you, appoint you, yourself. I think you could, probably, you could probably apply that to Lev. I mean, he's done some pretty phenomenal stuff, but... Um, no, um, history majors, okay, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, mate, we even had footnotes and everything, it was very academic. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. but yeah, it was just it was awesome just interviewing these people. I mean, Lev got us interviews with um, Dominic Rab, um, and you know, the kind of uh, cabinet members. Um, obviously, Johnny's in there, I had to get him in. Um, and um, yeah, it was so it's it's we we you know, we set the scene obviously with giving a history. <clears throat> Not just of the British part, but like what? Why? Because obviously the big, big part of this was the Taliban took back the country over. Well, how did the Taliban get into power in the first place? Who are the Taliban? What did the Taliban want? You know, we all kind of know that they're a nasty kind of regime. I don't like women being teachers and that kind of thing. But you know, what do they want? You know, so kind of went. We kind of explored that a bit, and then um, yeah, we covered the timeline of events there. Um, some stories lean more heavily on Americans because, um, you know, they they were the main kind of um, the main force in it. You know, we had force there, but it was very much a um, multinational operation. Um, I mean, you literally had um, Marines and Paris shoulder to shoulder, side by side, went through an incredible amount together, um, which is great. I think it just strengthens the bonds even further that had already been strengthened in the war on terror. Um, and really just kind of snatching, not I wouldn't say victory, because we we did leave people behind. Um, and we did leave, you know, in a chaotic fashion. But I just, I feel like this is one of those ones where really there was no right to have any kind of success the way that it was set up. And for the people who went over there to actually pull something out of it and to pull more than 15,000 people out, Brit, the Brit, Brits pulled more than 15,000 people out. I think they were expecting about 500 so they really did work miracles. It was an uh, incredible achievement. Well, why did we end up in that situation in the first place? What do you mean? As in, why do we end up in the situation where we... Well, I mean, there's a there's a few things around this. I think one of them is we had the this Arab process, which was, you know, to kind of uh, give safe passage to Britain for people that work directly with us. For instance, um, Afghan commandos, interpreters people who had a very high chance of being murdered by the Taliban for what, you know, for their kind of role with us. And um, unfortunately, the process was just taking too long. It was just hardly getting anybody out. So you had this massive glut of people as the country's falling. You know, we had we had years to get these people out. And this wasn't just a British problem, it was American too. I mean, one of my friends, uh, Tom Schumann, um, he's written a great book about the, his kind of mission. So they had um, Zaki, his interpreter, when they were in Sangin. Um, I believe in 2010, you know, when it was really kind of wild in Sangin. Um, he started the process for Zaki, I think in like 2016, of getting him out. And then August 2021, Zaki's still stuck in the country. So, I mean, this was just a, it was a failure of government, um, which, you know, is one of my favorite topics. Um, a failure of um, bureaucracy and just, there was no sense, there was no sense of urgency. And there was people... Um, trying to, you know, light the fire and, under it. Like uh, Larissa Brown, I believe she's the, the Times defense editor. You know, she really got the kind of campaign going of like, look, we're going to leave all these people behind and they're going to get fucking murdered. Um, so there was that side of things. Um, I mean, you'll probably agree with me. We never committed enough troops to Afghanistan at any point. Um, so that was very much the case of this. We didn't really... We, we, we were really caught down with our pants, you know... Um, around our ankles and there's a lot of unforgivable stuff in this for instance when the country began to fall it was very much like i think there wasn't anybody that we talked to who didn't think the taliban would take over the country eventually 
but their timeline was more, oh, it'll take them about six months or, or longer. You know, and they kind of forget, as, as Tom Schumann says, that the enemy gets, a, you know, the enemy gets a say too. And, you know, they, like, you know, from, look at it from a, a point of view of an Afghan soldier. You know, you've been fighting for almost 20 years. or well, the army's been fighting for almost 20 years in one shape or another. And then you've had your air support pulled from you. You're not getting paid because people basically started looting the treasury at this point. So these commanders, instead of paying the money to the troops, are just pocketing the money because they know that they're going to have to do one out of the country. So they're trying to collect as much money as they can. So you're not getting paid, you've not got support, and you know the best case scenario you're probably going to lose in six months. So once the Taliban, you know, very cleverly on their, on their point, they weren't murdering, Af you know, regular Afghan army soldiers. They were giving them, you know, basically like lay down your weapons, you can go home. And the army started to um, to collapse. And I don't like to say that it collapsed quickly because, as I said, like in one shape or another, they've been fighting for pretty much 20 years. That's a long, it's a long fucking time. I mean, most of us have done, like, longest most people have done in a war zone, British people, is six months. You know, so imagine going 20 years, plus your family could get murdered at any time, plus you could get murdered when you go on leave. So I don't think it's fair to say that they collapsed quickly, but they did collapse. Um, understandably so. And... Um, that wasn't taken into account. I think there was a lot of rose-tinted glasses going around, people thinking that things would be a lot better than they were. And when things did start going badly, there was no adjustment for it. So, for instance, Parliament were on their annual kind of summer holidays. And, um, you know, as these dominoes began to fall, it was still, oh, well, they won't take Kabul. So Parliament was not recalled until the day that Kabul fell. Um, they actually recalled Parliament faster for the death of Prince Philip than they did for the collapse of Afghanistan, which I think is, you know, you can read into that as you will, um, as, in terms of what their priorities are. But, um, you know, there was, yeah, I would say, mate, if we had to summarize the reasons, over-optimistic, um, or you could just say in denial about what was happening. Um, and then, you know, we sent, we started, we started feeding troops in. But once we started feeding troops in, the Taliban were already had already surrounded the airfield. So it wasn't possible. Instead of having, you know, instead of pushing out, and this obviously led directly into the suicide bombing as well, and the, the amount of deaths. Instead of pushing out and having outer cordons and checkpoints where you could filter people through, so the, the only people that would, in theory, should have arrived at the airport are people that were eligible to pass through the other checkpoints. There wasn't any of that. You had one line where you could check people and that's why you had these massive crowds that's why you had so much but that i'm well, just what i just want to so you're not suggesting that was the fault of the guys that the, the not at all, no i was going to say mate. that's the, the circumstance right that, that yeah. they found themselves in they couldn't go out and pr mate, they, pr present they, the they, ideal layered defense they, they didn't have the people mate. Mm. like these guys were awake for like four days at a time mm. you know because they were on the baseline. They were fil they were processing people. They were obviously having to do your your normal things like stagging on you know like a little bit high ground in the buildings. You've got your sangers and things up there. You know these guys were on their feet for days at a time. Um, like that, and that's why I said like the, what the actual troops did. And I think this is sometimes it kind of comes to the detriment of the military. We're so good of pulling something out of an app. What should be an absolute disaster. Our troops and the Americans recently as well have been so good at avoiding total disaster that I think that adds to the political complacency because it's like they do have thousands of superheroes that they can send into a situation and rescue things. But one of the stories that I got from a U.S. Marine um, company commander was everyone that's listening has probably seen that footage of the C-17 going down the runway with the crowd in front of it and the Apaches clearing the way. But what didn't get caught on camera was um, somebody started to climb up onto one of the Apaches. And so the Apache pilot obviously veers up to try and get this guy off. And um, Sam said that this, this Apache missed the C-17 by feet. Now, if that Apache had hit that C-17, you've all of a sudden got a fucking C-17 Hulk on uh, wreck, sorry, on the um, runway. The runway's closed. You haven't, there's not enough troops at that point to have cleared the airfield. So the airfield's closed for the foreseeable. The Taliban are all around there. Now, the Taliban were very quite disciplined. There was incidents of firefights on the airfield initially, but they soon stopped. The, the Marines and the U.S. infantry both had engagements where they killed, um, they did kill the enemy. Um, 
but for the main, you know, the Taliban really could have done a rogue drift on this thing. They really could have just pressed home, but they wanted us out of there. And I think their political class kind of understood that. Look, if we kill if we kill hundreds of them now, they might decide to come back into this country and start this again. So they wanted us out of there. Um, and you know, we can talk a bit more about how the British military had to work face to face with the Taliban. But um, you know, so you had this this like if that Apache had gone two feet the other way. You know, would like, would America like we saw what happened after the suicide bombing? That was it. Then they were like, right, time to go. We want people out. I mean, it was almost on the timeline anyway. But what would have happened if on the, you know if in that middle of August that Apache had hit that C seventeen? Would we have stuck around to evacuate anyone? I think it's a fair, fair like a fair guess to say that we probably wouldn't have. We probably would have tried to get our troops out, you know, hook by crook, hook or crook, and probably just left and left everyone. Um, you know, and that's more than a hundred thousand people that would have got left behind. So, I think th this whole thing was a lot closer to the total disaster than people realised. Oh, for sure. I don't think people underestimate the complexity of the operation that was going Massively on. complex. It's mate. like I remember. I remember when uh, when they were going out there in the first, you know, the first couple of days, the first day of watching what was going down on TV, and then seeing, you know, because probably like you, probably like a lot of relatively current ex-military like people are calling in favors left right and chelsea to try and assist getting people out of afghan if they couldn't get to the airfield and we're talking about trying to get afghans out yeah. of afghan it was you know but what it's like one story is what went on there mm -hmm. like what was over and you could see the other story is like this fucking huge network of people mm -hmm. in the uk and the state well no not uk and the states globally who were could who had a hand in and were able to connect people up and get people to our transport and just guide Afghans through to safe passage passage out the country. But what I was going to say the complexity of that operation. When I saw the guys going in and saw that first day and saw it on on the footage on TV, I, I remember thinking, "Fucking hell!" Like that that is one operation that is harder than anything I ever did. You know, yeah. you know, Afghan Iraq multiple multiple times. Did some difficult stuff, as many, many, many of us did, you included. That operation is probably, that is hands down one of the hardest things I've ever seen anyone do. And because, to your point, you're going into a situation where you can't dictate what the defence layers are. You can't dictate how you are going to protect yourself and how you're going to process these people through. And I've been in a similar situation to that on a much smaller scale in Musakala, much smaller scale. And it was a fucking nightmare, an absolute nightmare. Because you know what it's like. Ideally, you're going to go. You know, when you're going, you want to know you're going into a situation and there's going to be a threat, and you establish your base or your camp to deal with that threat. Right? They did have the op yeah. their option, right? And then it's a completely new thing. You've got the significant threat of um, IEDs, suicide bombers, small arms, like that threat, and then this, like, biblical. Biblical humanitarian crisis going on, and I don't use I use that word deliberately. Yeah. Fucking biblical, the amount of people trying to get in to get out of the country, and also the raw emotions involved. Like everyone's seen the footage of women and kids and the, the soldiers, like picking babies up over the fence because their their mothers or their fathers are giving them away to get them over there into safety, away from them. It's just the can you imagine being a, like a young Tom? No, no mind a commander or anything like that. Being yeah. a young Tom, some people are like their first tour. And mate, a like, lot of them were straight out of training. Yeah, exactly. There, straight there out, was some straight lads by the so end. By, by the end of that op, they'd spent longer on op pitting than they had done in the battalion. If you know what I mean, they'd spent longer on op pitting than they had done in Colchester. Mm -hmm. Just to give you one on complexity, um, when the Taliban started overrunning the country, the air traffic controllers from Kabul went, oh, "Fuck this, we're off." So there was no air traffic control. So for this operation, one of the biggest airlifts in history, there was an American um, American JTAC with a whiteboard, and that was how all the air traffic <laughs> control was done. Um, you know, which mean I mean, you know, there's we give quite rightly we give medals of honor and Victoria crosses out for for actions in the face of the enemy, but I mean that guy, you know, he's responsible for saving tens of thousands of lives. Um, but the pilots were telling me, you know, that they'd you'd literally just be coming in and you just have to look for other aircraft. And a few times other aircraft had cut in front of you. And again, you know, we're talking about how close to disaster, you know, we're talking about 
Because it's you know you, I'm imagining you've got some very big blind spots when you're flying a Hercules, you know, C130 or whatever it's called, and um, you know all of a sudden you're coming into land and another one comes up right in front of you. Uh, you know, there's instances about planes coming into land and there's vehicles on the runway, people on the runway, and you're having to make these for these pilots make these split second decisions of, do I try and land? There was one pilot I spoke to. So there was Tracer going up at the end of the runway and he was like, we're going to go straight into that if we don't land. But then there was trucks on the runway. So he was like, well, I've got to make a decision of either trying to just land just over the top of these trucks or fly into that what was he Tracer. C-17? I think he was flying a C-130. You know, so there's all these things where if he'd made the wrong decision there, again, we're talking massive disaster. And the troops on the ground, I mean, obviously, um, anyone that's ex-military can probably guess, I'm not going to talk about it, but you can probably guess that there was assets to go out to that kind of thing out there. But, you know, I mean, we all know what happened in Black Hawk Down. Well, imagine C-130 down, you know, or a C-130 taking off, hitting a truck on the runway when it's full of, you know, 600 people packed in the back. I mean, the, the, the margin for error in this thing was none. And the fact that it came out, I mean, obviously there was a tragic event at the at the gate. And I mean, I'm sure you're the same way, mate. When I heard the numbers coming out after that suicide bomb in IED, I was like, I was like, this must have been this huge truck bomb or something. I was like, how is this possible from a, you know, a person carrying a suicide vest? And it came down into the, the fact that hundreds of people were pressed so tightly against each other that the, 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 this, the effect of that the IED had, like basically it was in, if you imagine this, you've got high blast walls on either side. And what this guy did is he climbed up, he stood up on this low, low barrier, detonated his vest, so it was at head height to people, literally just shaving their heads off people. Um, and then the blast itself, the blast injury from that. So loads of people had blast injuries. And then there's people, you know, a bit like, you know, if you get, you're one of the first people to get hit, all of a sudden your bones then become shrapnel. So you got bones going into other people. And, and that's how it was such a high number of casualties. And I spoke to people who were at that. And I'm not going to, you know, go too into what they said, because that's kind of their story to tell. And that's why it's in their own words in the book. But just carnage on a scale that British soldiers probably haven't seen since the Second World War. You know, I spoke to a medic going up to where, oh, not, Korea, long, not long after they came back. I went up to uh, Colchester to go meet up with a good friend, and he's a serving medic, and he was out there, and uh, he was describing the aftermath of that. So he wasn't collecting the bodies off the ground, but he he said he was controlling the triage point. Mm -hmm. Uh, which was, or you man, he's on the triage point, which was, wasn't it wasn't a triage point. It was fucking just a huge mm -hmm. area. He said the trucks are coming in, any vehicles are coming in, which are just the guys and the girls who are serving there. Picked these bodies up, lifeless or not, don't know. Chucked them onto the wagons, and then they were just coming, pulling up, chucking, not throwing, but unloading the bodies onto the pan to be triaged by all these other medics. Mm -hmm. He just like all hands to the pump, then he just go back out, another truck would come in, another load of bodies just come off. He said it was just, uh, it was just horrendous. Yeah. It was just, he said it was just a, a, a horrendous time. And, and, and the medics said anything like it. And he's again, another guy who's served multiple times in multiple mm -hmm. operations in multiple theaters of war, you know, and, and he's, and he was describing it as just like never seen anything like it. Car to you describe yeah. it, carnage, you know. And I, I want to be really careful in like, I think some of the way we're describing stuff here is like almost seems like glorifying it. I certainly not glorifying it. Like what happened, I, I, you should, like the fact that we had to do that withdrawal and the way it went down and 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 the result of it is just fucking like you just just you, that situation should, like that should never never have come about. I think everyone's agreement with that. But you know, um, to to the point you made earlier, like to to make it the make it the success it was, which it was a success, yeah. as in that withdrawal is uh, something else, something else. Yeah. I mean, you can glorify the actions of the people on the ground <clears throat> while condemning the reasons that it happened and putting them in that position. Some people did everything that they could and more. Some other people, for instance, the British government, did not do everything that they could do and more. You know, like... For instance, you know, look at the Arab process. It was never fit. It was never up to task. The what process? The Arab process, which was the um, I forget the acronym. It was it's been a while since I've written another two books since this one made. So <laughs> some of this stuff is a little hazy. But um, you know, basically, you this was the process through which interpreters, Afghan commandos, etc. But you know, the the other thing about this, you know, we had there wasn't like 
much kind of um, common sense kind of apply to it. For instance, you're asking people who maybe speak English but don't write English to fill out this paperwork in English. And then you're also asking them to go across Kabul with all the Taliban checkpoints, carrying the paperwork which will prove that they need to be executed. You know, <laughs> yeah. so a lot of people, the first thing they did when the Taliban took over was burn the documents. So any support and evidence they had, they burn it. And you can't blame them for that. But then there was incidents like the U.S. Uh, embassy had a backlog of passports, etc., from Afghans that were awaiting visas. Well, when the U.S. embassy had to be evacuated, they burnt all the passports and things. So then you've got all these people who'd write like uh, uh, qualified people applying for pass uh, applying for, for asylum in the states who now don't even have a passport. So they can't even go to Pakistan or anything like that. So, you know, there was a lot of real fuck ups, real fuck ups. Afghan, Afghan relocations and assistance policy. Yeah. Oh, um, did you get access to any serving soldiers? Yes. Reg blokes Reg that blokes. were out there. And they, you got what? So, I mean, you mentioned about the, um, you mentioned about the near misses with the air, airframes. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you've discovered? During the book, you are left, which which surprised even you guys, as like as being ex mill yourself and, and knowing that about that, what went on out there. But personal stories with those with those guys and girls. I, I think um, the, I, I think kind of what surprised me was you could see the chaos on the TV, but I don't think you could fully appreciate it until you heard from guys there just how constant that was. Because you turn the TV on, you watch it for a couple of minutes. So you're kind of left with this impression of like, oh, it must be like a surge or something like that. But this was just the constant state. Like anyone that's ever been to a big rugby or football game, you know what the crowds are like there. Well, just imagine that crowd is panicked and terrified for their lives and they're at, trying to get through this one gate and they're there for two weeks. And you've got that crowd of desperate people constantly for two weeks. And for every person you can let through, there's others you can't. And I think one of the... There was one story that sticks out where um, there was a guy who uh, spoke great English. He had pictures on his phone of him in America with his family. Um, clearly, clearly somebody who had American family. The Taliban had taken everything off him. Um, he had fresh marks from where he'd been whipped. And they couldn't let him through because he didn't have paperwork. And things like that really kind of stick out to you. There's another one where some Afghan commandos who were... Um, escorting a general out of the country, they were brought through by the paras, put onto a flight, and then the US State Department kicked them off and kicked them back out of the airport. You know, things like that where you're like, God, oh, these people were there right on the edge. And they were there to be saved and because of paperwork were kicked back out. Now there's a time and a place for paperwork. And like the you know the other argument to this is uh, there's probably a lot of people who got out of the country who weren't qualified. But I would rather take too many than leave behind the people who deserved it. Yeah. Well, I mean, talking about people who got out when we drove here, did you see, did you notice there's a couple of people walking down the road a few hundred metres away? I did. With, and one of them was dressed in I did, traditional yeah. Middle Eastern. That, so that hotel, right. full of Afghans. Right. Yeah, Just yeah. Just fucking yeah. drag them in here, mate. Get them on it. Like, they, give you a lot, they give you a lot better account than I can. So and that, I want to make that very clear as well. As like I have made... Um, you know, we put a lot of effort into this book. We put, you know, we, we interviewed a lot of people. Um, we did, you know, we did a lot of reading around it. Um, but it's not our story. It's Why did you want to do it? And what, what gave you the authority to do it? Well, the, I, I would say the author. So um, I think one of the easiest ways to go about answering this would be you were mentioning the kind of the mentioning the veteran network, right? So I don't know. I don't want to overstate my part in this, but I, I have some first hand experience of it. And I think it's quite an illustrative story. So I'm not trying to paint out that I was fucking Mother Teresa of Kabul here by, by any means, right? But I did have an insight into it. And, um, oh, when it was going on and that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I started getting messages from Americans um, saying that, like, mate, do you know anyone at Two Para? Because I can't, you know, we can't get anybody out through the, Amer through the American means. We can't get anyone out. And I did hear as well that an American unit that shall not be named just went off reservation and just said, fuck this, and just started to go out and get blokes and off the books, which is fucking Ali. Going to get an Afghan to bring them in. Yeah, yeah, which is super Ali. But um, yes, but officially they weren't supposed to be doing that. I think they got in a lot of shit for it. But um, So hats off to those blokes. But um, yeah, I started getting texts and I said, well, first person I thought, I thought Lev. So I'll get in contact with Lev. 
And then Lev put me in contact with Mike Pratt. And it was mad, mate, because I'd be having these phone calls with people, um, you know, and I'm sitting in my underpants at home with a cup of tea, safe as houses. And you're asking this bloke, like, yeah, trust me, go to this place. Yeah, I know we've, ne know we've never spoken before, but please get your family in the car and go to this place and put your lives in my hands. And um, f so Lev put me in touch with um, another former uh, parrot officer. And um, he got he got <laughs> dozens and dozens and dozens of people out. And, um, you know, by using this network, you know, we were it, the, it came down to, you know, it would start with someone like uh, contacting someone on social media. Then you'd reach out to your network. They'd reach out to theirs. Then they'd reach out to someone and eventually you'd get someone who's at the gate. And you've got this chain of people talking. And then, you know, I had a few phone calls from people. You'd phone them up and they got through and they're crying with happiness and stuff. And you start crying. I mean, it's just, it was incredible emotion. I, I, like I said, I, I did a fractional part of this entire thing, like a tiny part. But I felt like I did more in those few phone calls than I did in six months in Africa, without a doubt. Um, you know, so, so me and Lev had both, so, we we had an idea of what had happened. Um, we had an idea of what had happened, and we just thought like, you know, we we, we just kind of talking. We thought, I wonder if anyone's just we just kind of just hanging out one day. We were just kind of talking. And I thought, I wonder if anyone's doing this book. So we reached out to, um, um, you know, you know him well, Adam Jowett at uh, Red One Headquarters. If you're interested in learning more about Adam and Hugh in Muscala, check out No Way Out, available in the e-book hardback <laughs> and on audio. I had to sign a copy of that yesterday. <laughs> I had to sign a copy of that yesterday. Mike, yeah. Mike Valance had a copy of that. Where's my book. royalties? He want, I think he wanted you to sign it as well. I know, yeah. Oh, yeah, fucking yeah. Well, I, well, royalties are due, mate. We've been drinking and I didn't bring the book and he's still got it and he's in London today. So. All right, well, I'll just take a pint off you later then we'll call it quits. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we were like, well, look, we know the people here. We know the people involved, um, you know, and I've been very like, you know, I'm kind of, we're kind of joking around, but I felt very privileged to tell the story of No Way Out, or sorry, not tell the story, but help write the story of No Way Out. I felt very privileged in doing that. Um, I did a book last year with a Falklands veteran. I was an honor to do that. And this is what I like to do. I like to write about these things because it's my job. And we're just like, well, look, if someone's going to do this, well, why not us? You know, if not me, then who? And... It started, we were just going to do, literally just going to talk to like the Reg blokes and stuff. But then we soon realized that this isn't something like, this needs to be bigger in scope. Because, um, and... Well, what was the original like, scope? So. The original scope was we were going to just kind of do the British kind of involvement there. But then <clears throat> it started becoming very clear that the British involvement and the American involvement was really one and the same. Because these guys were, as I said, shoulder to shoulder. Um, and... A lot of my best friends are American Marines. So I reached, again, power of network, reached out to the guys. Guys, do you know anyone that was a cabal? Yeah, here's this guy's number. Here's that guy's number. So then I got to speak to Americans who were on the ground, got to speak to officers, spoke to an EOD, spoke to grunts, spoke to a U.S. Navy nurse, you know, who was dealing with all the casualties after the blast. And, you know, the book originally was going to be quite a short book. And it was, uh, and I think we got like, originally we were going to do like 60,000 words and it ended up being over 100,000 or something. And and then Lev, you know, he, he just gets places water can't get. He'd be like, oh, now I've got us meeting with, with Dominic Rabb, you know, the foreign secretary. And it's just, it just kept, because we just have, we kept having to extend the deadline because it's like, well, we can't not have this bloke. But I think my favorite interview came when I was, I was out in America. I was in a bar close to Camp Pendleton, which is where a lot of the Marines are based. And I was telling my mate about the book, and he was like, oh, I know one of the Marines that was injured in the blast. Do you want to speak to him sometime? I was like, oh, I'd yeah, I'd love to. Thank you. He go, cool, he's in the next bar. Okay. So I went down. I'm assuming it was a great interview. We were both passed out in the car park afterwards. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no idea, but it just kind of grew me. And and then we started getting, um, we you know, uh, after these, some of these aid agencies started to put us in touch with Afghans, and then, um, <clears throat> you know, we, we interviewed quite a few Afghan civilians, some Afghan SF, uh, Afghan interpreters, we interviewed them, um, you know, and it was, it was just, it, I mean, it was a learning curve, like, there's definitely things I've learned that I, I made mistakes in this book, um, which, you know, I've learned for the next one, but I mean, that's, that's just kind of how it goes, you know, um, and, um, you know, it's like some of the interviews, I had to find like a diary translator online, and I'd ask the questions, and then they'd give them, and then you're trying to translate the diary, and it doesn't quite always translate exactly word for word, so... 
it, it, it was just really interesting me. I mean, some of the interviews left me in tears. I mean, talking to a mother who knows that her children might die. And this is what I wanted to say about casualties. You know, yes, there was a lot of casualties at the suicide bombing. But these people at the gates, we, 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 you know, we call the chapter the gates of hell because that's really what it was. Um, you had these people, like you had children dying of heat, uh, of heat illnesses. You had people being trampled to death. You had people being shot. You had people being whipped. You know, it was, you know, you had people taking children and laying kids down over barbed wire to walk over them, to walk over the wire. Oh my God. You had people stealing kids because they knew if they had kids with them, then that would get, they, they'd have a better chance of getting in and then abandoning the kids once they'd passed the checkpoints. Um, so we interviewed Colonel Dave Middleton, CO2 power at the time. And he said, um, I'm paraphrasing both. You, you know, you could find the best and worst of humanity outside the Baron Hotel, um, which was, you know, where the kind of the powers were established. And I, that's really true. Like when you read the book, you just there's some parts in it where you can't be more proud to be a member of the human race. And then there's other parts where it, you just can't under like the, the level of disgust that you feel for the actions of these people. You know, I mean, the way that they got the runway cleared was Afghan you know, partner forces came in and cleared the runway by basically running people over and shooting them. Um, I think I looked at the Wikipedia entry once for this, you know, for the thing, and I think it says that there were seven civilian deaths or something, which is just... I mean, I spoke to people who saw that in, a, in an afternoon, people being crushed to death, trampled to death, or just dying, because a lot of people went... You know, you imagine... it, mate, you, you and me have been in Afghan in the summer. Afghan in the summer... Imagine you're an Afghan in the summer, in a crowd of thousands of people. You've got no water, you've got no shade. You imagine the smell and the fear and people pushing and shoving and people just dropping dead. Um, and as you said, mate, I totally agree with you. I think what they went through, they did a six-month tour plus in two weeks. They really did. Um, you know, and I, I think we really need to be... I, I, the other thing as well is, you know, we, we really have to look out, out, for, out for these people that went on there because I think, you know, we've seen how many people suffer mentally after fighting tours. I mean, this, if that stuff doesn't give you nightmares, I don't know what fucking will. Um, I found it hard working on a fucking book about it and I never came within a thousand miles of the well, city. You know, this is the thing for every... For every... And again, I wasn't there, but I... You know, I saw the guys on. I could see the guys on those checkpoints, on the fences, on the on the uh, on not on the fences, on the um, Hesco bastions, and on the top of ice containers. And for every person that they were able to process through a checkpoint, there were fucking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds that they had to look at in a crowd. I knew they couldn't help. Yep. I knew they couldn't help. I knew they were going to leave. And a lot of them spoke English, mate. So they, they'd be pleading yep. for their life. And a lot of them, like I said, that guy with the phone, with the pictures of America, you know, he's legit. And, and even if that lad had let him through, he would have been turned around on the next stage. And they had a section whose job was to fucking pull people out who'd got through the gate, but had then failed the next step. So imagine that. Your job is then to take this, this family, think they've got through, and your job is then to drag this family kicking and screaming and take them back out um, and put them on the other side of the fence where they're telling you that the Taliban are going to murder them. Why did we end up in that situation? Well, like I said earlier, mate, we, um, like, I think a lot of the people said, and that this came from Americans that were, had been, so some of the Americans that were out there were actually, they were kind of the, the well, I suppose you could call them the force protection company in Kabul. So they took over from the Blackwatch lads um, in the summer. So they were out there and they, they couldn't believe it when we, when we closed Bagram. Because when Bagram closed, like, there was, all of a sudden we were left with one place that was so... That was kind of part of the problem because there was no like orderly stage thing of right, right, okay, we know you've applied. This is the date you're to report to the airport. There was nothing like that. So people were just going. And then once there, once there was chaos, a lot of people realized like, if we, because if, for instance, if, if there'd been a very orderly process with, let's say, two cordons out, you know, you've got two cordons out, you're pushed out away from the airport, people probably wouldn't have chanced their arm and stuff as they did. But once people realized that there was a chance of just bums rushing their way onto a flight, you started to get a lot of young Afghan men who were not qualified in any way to come over, who were just like, well, fuck it, I'm just going to chance my arm to get... But you know, why did we end up in a situation where we were leaving and the Af and the Taliban were in a position to take over? That's oh, you mean, saying. why did we lose the war? 
Is that is that the question? Could be could phrase it that way. Okay, well, why did we lose the war? Because um, we try to fight an enemy that don't care about time on a time frame, um, and we never committed enough assets to it. Um, we fought the war in a lot of wrong ways. Um, for instance, well, it wasn't a war. So it wasn't a war. It wasn't a war. It wasn't was it? Pe sorry, police action. <laughs> No, I don't know what it was. It wasn't a war. I mean, it was a campaign of sorts, but it wasn't a war, it was, was a war. it? It was a war, mate. I mean, it's like... People, um, people shooting each other is a war, mate. It, no, I mean, in terms of, you know, definition, but, like, what, what get, was... Get the, your Collins when you say out, we, when, we, when you say we did, okay, let's call it war. When we say we didn't win, what what was the objective? Well, How that, would we yeah, this, 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 we and Yeah, exactly. Well, this is, that is one of the major problems. We never had defined aims. You know, we never had defined aims. We went to... The, the defined aim to begin with was to take out Al-Qaeda and to stop Afghanistan being a base for operations. Then we got into this regime change war with the Taliban. Um, you know, we ousted the government, we put a new one in, and um, the Taliban bided their time at first, and then, you know, you were out there, and then, um, I mean, so this is one of the, the, some of the facts that came out. So we, there was more than 70,000 civilian deaths, direct deaths by violence when we were there, and a lot of those were caused by throughout the campaign. Yeah, yeah, but a lot of those were caused by um, our, our airstrikes. Um, and so we had Taliban, you know, we, we, we weren't able to interview any Taliban. We did try. We did reach out. We actually reached out to the Taliban to try and get some, um, to get some direct interviews. So we had to use some kind of a, kind of a, a, other other sources. But, you know, a lot of the Taliban were, there's one of the, one of the ones that sticks out to me was this guy. He did social care at university, I think in Kabul. And he wanted to help drug addicts in Afghanistan. So this is a guy who clearly cares about people. This isn't, this isn't your your bloodthirsty monster. And his thing was that he began to saw America as an occupier, um, was sick of the amount of people being killed by American air airstrikes. So he joined the Taliban. Um, so I think in some places, one of the things that we did, we did a very good job in Kabul of giving people there the new kind of life. But most people in the rural areas, all they ever saw was war. You know, and you can call it what you want, but fucking airstrike's an airstrike, you know. And um, I think a lot of people there just wanted an end to the violence. And so to give some, and this is why the context at the beginning of the book was important. You know, so you know, there was a very violent revolution, a communist revolution in Afghanistan at the beginning of the 80s that the Russians then threw their weight in and supported. You then had this extremely bloody campaign against the Russians. And then I think this is where the West really let itself down is there was a chance then to kind of establish some kind of peace at the end of that. But instead, we continued to support one side. Russia supported the other. So there was a bloody war that I think it was claimed something like two million lives. Um, and then on the back of this, you had all these warlords who were raping, bribing, pillaging the country. And the Taliban offered some kind of stability because they were, when they initially came in, you know, it started as this movement who was this, this movement against the warlords etc so you know it's easy for us to say oh well the taliban you know they chop the hands off of fees and stuff they're brutal people but when you when you set that against the backdrop of say 15 years of constant war and rape and pillage you're probably willing to have people's hands chopped off in order to have some kind of stability you know so they came into they came into power and then after 9 11 we went in and, you know, I always actually thought that I was under the impression that our initial campaign was very surgical, but we actually killed more than 3000 people in those first few months after 9-11. You know, it, it, it was, you know, it was within a few months, we'd almost killed as many people as that died on 9-11, you know, Afghan civilians through, through airstrikes. And, um, you know, you say we talk about the West, like the, the West, to NATO, say, yeah, you know, NATO, yeah. it was a NATO mission, wasn't it? So, um. You know, so the, 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 we never had a plan, as you alluded to. There was, n there was never any clear plan there. There was never any clear objective. And um, I think it was in 2011 that Obama announced the timeline for pulling people out. I mean, you remember, like, 2011, you, there, it's not like there was any semblance of peace in the country. Um, the Afghan army started taking over more operations. Their, their losses were horrendous. Like, I think it's over, like, 150,000 or something like that. Absolutely horrendous. And that was with air support. So, you know, like they've gone through that and then we're like, right, good luck without any fucking air support. Now, mate, no way out, as I know from having, you know, had insight into your story, you guys would have been fucked without air support. Fair enough to say? Didn't have air support. 
Didn't yeah. have any air support in, in Monte Carlo. No. At the start we did. And then later on but we you did. did. We did. You did to begin with, though, didn't you? Because yeah, you had to begin with on you. Yeah, right. Yeah. That was a big help to you, wasn't it? Yeah. Right. And yeah, it, sorry, yes, yes. And it was a it was a big help to a lot of Brits. I mean, there's a lot of contacts that have been broken because of air power. Mm-hmm. Where guys you might have it might have been as simple as someone was wounded that you weren't able to get out without air power. Because I know you had to use I tell you, like, we did have we did have we did have air assets and so it, we couldn't they couldn't get them on the ground. So we couldn't troop ground, we couldn't that, but yes, we had air assets. We yeah. had A tens, war hogs, and we exactly. had I apologize. So imagine yes. so imagine you were in that position now with no A tens, no yeah, Apaches, yeah, 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 yeah. no fucking J Dams, no nothing, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, like and so that's what we were asking the Afghans to do. So that was another kind of reason. But you know, we under we well, I say we underestimated the, tal- underestimate the Taliban. I think a lot of people did see how this was going to end up. But we never we never beat them when when they left the when when they kind of ceded power at the beginning of the war. They were never beaten. They were just regrouping. They pulled. They were very cleverly pulled across. The, the aim wasn't to beat them, though, right? But th- well, th- but this is what I mean, mate. What was the aim? Nobody knows. That's the point of making. No, yeah, nobody knows. Um, and unfortunately that seems to be, you know, like that, that seems to be a trait of the last 20 years of like, what, 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 what was, what was the aim in Iraq? What was the aim in Libya? Now, if you to say it was to remove Saddam, all right, mission successful. But at that point, then why do you stay on? You know, and what, what, if the aim was to remove Gaddafi, all right, you did that. Now Libya is a failed state. So with all of these things, you know, we kind of look at them and, like, and it, you know, it's again, it's you look at Afghanistan, and really, if we'd have stayed another 50 years, would it have ended differently? I don't know if it would have. But what I can say to try and give some positivity into this is that there's um, something like Johnny gave the statistic the other day it's something like 60% of, Afghanistan, of Afghanistan's population is under 25. So there's a massive percentage of that population who grew up, a lot of them seeing a different possibility. Um, but now to be a little unoptimistic, I think as well, a lot of people overestimated the difference between the Taliban and the Afghan government. Um, because while there was not necessarily like the public executions and things like that, it's still very much was this kind of tribalistic. Um, what was the word be like? So you know, if you if you knew someone, you could get a job. If you didn't, you didn't. There was ma- still massive unemployment there. A lot of the money and development was going into one or two places. So a lot of the country never really saw much benefit. All they got was a fight on their doorstep for fifteen years. So I, I think really. It's you, you, you. We don't know what it was about. None of us know what it was about. Like we were never told. I mean, I can make my guesses about what it was about, but there was they were not definitely not the official lines. And um, you know, like there's it, there was no clear aim. And I think for us who we grew up on, grandparents who fought in the Second World War, great grandparents who fought in the First, they were very clearly defined wars with very clearly defined ends. And I think what we're seeing now is. You know, the difference with a war like Afghanistan and, you know, Iraq, where you've just got these, like I saw the other day in Basra, you know, the tribes are still going at each other in Basra. They were doing that when I was there 20 years ago, you know. Um, And it's, I don't know if you can have a clearly defined place in somewhere where our clearly defined ideas do not fit the reality on the ground, which is tribes, sects, religions, all this kind of fucking hodgepodge of different alliances. It's it has been a very it, it, you know looking back in in retrospect it has been I mean today is what twenty years since twenty years yeah, since the invasion yeah, of Iraq like, and I was yeah. you know I did that yeah you did the invasion point. yeah, yeah I was in the invasion um, and it has been a very very strange twenty three years start to this century uh, you know started off mm-hmm. with nine eleven right and the the pessimistic side of me wants is it, that's the right word looks at it and thinks that you know with the full knowledge of what we went out the pretenses in which we went out to different areas for uh, reasons for countries reasons for when I say we I mean the west mm-hmm. you know, I'm not saying we as in my unit or the UK um, I think that uh, uh, yeah, the, the pessimistic side of me thinks that we it's, uh, it's a it's a game 
Warmongering is a game that has been allowed to run away with itself over the last 20 years in order to line people's pockets with money and power. That is the pessimistic side of me. I do yeah. think that's the case. And and I think that's, that's I, I don't think there's a conspiracy to it. No, to I this, agree, I, agree with you, I don't think there's a conspiracy to it that is, oh, like 23 years ago, 9-11, this is the excuse we need. I don't think it is. I think 9-11 happened. We went into Afghan in 2002. We went into Iraq in 2003. And then, like on the cartoons, you see money flashing in front of people's eyes. And fast forward 20 years, and how many countries, how many places have we fucked up? How many places have we gone into? Do you know what you don't get anymore? Five day wars, three month wars. Yeah. You don't get them. <laughs> no. You don't get them. Yeah. They are years long. Yeah. Like, and I look at it in the same way as, I mean, as a possibility. This is most likely, I think. I look at it in the same way with Ukraine. I look at it in the same way with, with Ukraine. You know, I, I don't think that. I don't think I think that Russia had the right. Well, no, Russia didn't have the right to go. Inv- who has the right to go invade anywhere no, yeah, in this no, day and age? They don't, right? But but equally, who has the right to go and step in? A third party to go and step in and declare one side or the other the correct side. I I think it's very ballsy for anyone to do that. And and in the in the case of Ukraine, I think the main reason that we are there now, we being the West, there now and throwing so much money at it. Is because there's so much money to be made. Right. Well, on sorry. one side and on the other side, getting involved in it is very, very advantageous to certain uh, sides of the political sphere, depending where you are in the Western world, and depending what stage in the um, what stage in the you know in the run up to the next election you are. Yeah. Uh, and that is the pessimistic side of me. I think it is. I I genuinely, that's probably the most likely scenario. I, I, I agree. Uh, with me. Uh, sorry to jump in. Yeah. Like Iraq. With the reasons we went there, bullshit. I, I know this. The reasons that we went to Iraq, bullshit. Proud I went there. Proud I served my country. Like, genuinely am. I am very glad of the experiences that made me the man I am today. We went in there for bullshit reasons. Afghanistan, the problem is there was, well, for, I don't know what the reasons we went in, but let's look at it from a purely, uh, oh, we went in for the right reasons, and but what went wrong? We had mission creep. And we, but the, it was mission creep. We didn't know what the fucking mission was, and it just kept changing and changing and changing. And it was very short, short term, short sighted thinking. I think that's on the baseline level. Fuck that up. Libya, fuck that up. Ukraine, what are we doing there? Like, I, I, is in what, what if there, if there was a real major issue in Ukraine going right now, going right now, a real concern to us, the West. Like, I mean, majorly. We'd be treating it very differently than to what we're treating it now, I think. Well, mate, we're, we're really basically flirting with, and I think it's a small chance, but it is a chance, flirting with World War Three over who controls the Donbass region of Ukraine. Like, and and like, so just, just to bring it back to what you were saying, mm-hmm. I, I looked this up the other day. So as you can imagine, at the end of the Afghan war, defense stocks plummeted, some of them by 60%. By February, when that war started again, they were through the fucking roof and remained through the roof. There was a peace deal on the table between Ukraine and Russia early on in the war, which Britain helped to scupper by saying, like, no, no, don't sign this deal. We'll keep arming you. Um, and what's going to happen in the end, I think, will be they will be um, basically the same deal, which could have got done a lot, ti- a lot of time, a lot of destruction and a lot of lives earlier will get done in the end. Um, I totally support the Ukrainians' rights to defend themselves. I think Putin is unequivocally wrong in what he did. I also don't think that we should be extending a war, proxy war. And at at first, you know, you'd come out and say this is a proxy war and people are, you're fucking conspiracy theorists. And then eventually you start to have the politicians come out and basically admit that, yeah, it is a proxy war. We're testing a lot of kit out there. You know, we're getting our kit tested against um, armor, airframes, all sorts like that. Um, making a lot of money off it. And it's not just the money we're giving the Ukraine. Within that first few months of the war, you look at look at some of the contracts that then Poland come out and order X billion of this. Germany come out and order X billion of this. America have X billion of this. The contracts that came out in that first few months. And with the military industrial complex, it's not as simple as, um, you know, people think about politicians getting kickbacks and stuff from the companies, which they do. A lot of these political campaigns, you know, they get donations from these companies. But it could be the case of, like, let's say in your town, you've got a factory that makes um, 
like let's say um, you've got your you've got the factory that makes javelins, right? And um, the Afghan war finishes. Well, you as a politician are then under pressure of because if that that, com- uh, that that factory then has to close, you are then not going to have um, you're 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 then you've lost jobs in your town, you know, which is big, obviously, no no for a politician. So it's, it's it's not even like this. I don't even think a lot of the time it's like nefarious, like oh, I want the money. It's just like oh, I got to keep my people happy. So, you know, well, you know, and war is good for you know, war is good for business. Um, but also, as you were saying, you know, when COVID happened, and rightly or wrongly, America printed trillions of dollars. You know, Britain, you know, we 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 extended our debt, and then all of a sudden, well. well the reason we got inflation is because of Putin invading. It's a very nice little scapegoat of saying, well, the reason we got the problem is this guy. It's not because we printed trillions of dollars in the last few years. You know, the idea that Putin invading all of a sudden causes inflation and it has nothing to do with three years and the massive, the biggest, um, you know, the uh, Trump spending bill was the biggest one in U.S. government history. And the U.S. debt is just climbing and climbing and climbing. You know, it's... It, <laughs> And I, unfortunately, like as human beings, we like to give the benefit of doubt to people. But the way I kind of think about it is none of us give a benefit of doubt to a cartel leader. We we know that guy is a bad guy, right? You say a bad guy, he's chopping people's heads off because he wants to be real. Like, no one's like Pablo Escobar is a great bloke. We know that the violence he did was polit- uh, financially motivated. And I think we have to just start looking at some of our leaders in the eyes and just saying that like this guy's Pablo Escobar in Westminster or he's Pablo Escobar in the White House. You know, some people are fucking bad people and unfortunately a lot of them find their ways into powerful positions. And I think a lot of them as well, they might even go in there for the good reasons, but the system of where so much of this money's from, and like I said, it's tied into drugs, it's tied into the people who have supported getting them into those positions. So last time I was on here, I think we talked about Tulsi Gabbard, you know, and you brought up that she she wouldn't accept any major uh, any of these big contributions from people like Raytheon or Lockheed, and it's so you can stay neutral. But you know, like so to, to yeah, like she they, got they, run out. And like, she got she got basically yeah, ousted from exactly. the presidential race. But right? like Elizabeth Warren, for instance, she was on this kind of like Senate committee for arms procurements, and she's got massive investments in the arms companies. Like like and not and like I don't think you and me would be any different, mate. If you and me knew that if we gave a contract that we were going to get. Basically, because it's not even less necessarily a kickback of here's your money. It's just you've got shares in that company. So if you've got a million dollars worth of share and a war kicks off, you know that's going to go up to two, three million dollars, right? And and so that's one of the big problems is the fact that a lot of, especially in American politicians, Nancy Pelosi's worth more than 100 million. How is that possible when she's earned six figures her whole life? The, the numbers just don't add up. Why? It's because she's in, like the, and this, this isn't just for war, for instance, when when the lockdowns happened in America, um, she, they sold their shares in all the companies that were going to get forced to close and bought more in the ones that could stay open. So it's not just a war thing. It's just a financial incentive thing. And war has financial incentives for people. Um, I do think my, my one case for optimism with um, Ukraine is that the, the public support in America is dropping and dropping fast. I don't think that the Democratic candidate can run on supporting the war. So I do think that if Biden's plan on running again or whoever succeeds him, I think that they will wrap it up before the presidential uh, run starts going. But then, so, but on the on the flip side, what does that mean for Ukraine, Ukrainian it people? It means that they'll get the same deal as they got a while ago, which is Donbass is essentially Russian-controlled. And and the, the other thing as well, people always talk about they wanted to take Kiev. I'm still under the impression that that was a feint um, to try and basically kind of... I, I I do think that they wanted... It's a pretty big feint, mate. It'll no, no, but... Yes, but I do think that they, they wanted... The other thing as well, like... And, I, and I'm not sticking up for in Russia. Fact, it's the worst feint in yeah. history. Well, I'm not sticking... But you're not supposed uh, yeah, to lose troops on a feint, are you? No, but you do. You know, you do lose <laughs> troops on a feint. Like, mate, because you, you, you and me are used to the... You and me are used to the British military way of thinking, which is we try and lose as little people as possible. Russians don't think like that, mate. Look at Grozny, all that kind of stuff. That Russians think is we throw people at a problem... And eventually we solve the problem. That's the American way of thinking as well. Well, it's so. it's a Russian one, but like, so I'm not. So again, I'm not sticking up for Russia here because what they did was wrong. But let's flip the tables, right? Because one of because one of the things people always say to me is, "Oh, so you're thinking like you know with Hitler, you would have just let him go all the way across Europe?" And I said, "Well, let's reverse that and look at that from Russians' point of view." NATO in the early '90s was in Germany. 
now it's on Russia's border. And you've got people like Hillary Clinton saying, Russia is on NATO's border now. No, you're the one that's gone up yeah, to Yeah, I know, Russia. I know, I know that argument, right? I know that argument. But yeah. there's two sides to that. Well, there is, with like, I'm not saying that. I'm, that's what know, I'm saying. Yeah, it's not it's, right or wrong. It's, uh, like, should those countries have the right to join NATO? They should. But we should also recognise that there will be a reaction to that action, right? Yeah, yeah. So I again, oh, it's like, not simple. This, no, you know, the whole no, NATO totally. Russia it yeah. is not simple. Like, he, but he, it's almost like he's more, mm. Russia more predictable yeah. because it's Russia. Yeah. Like, but for Russia to perceive what NATO is doing in the West, mm -hmm. look at look at all of the complexities of what he has to assess mm. all the different leaders of the states yeah. all of the different yeah. like intentions of the state yeah, just but one, one more thing I will say about it though mate and this is again I'm not in Russia's defence but look at what's happened in America the last like kind of eight years where you've had um, like what did we do with Saddam all this newspaper articles oh he's going to hit he's going to hit a British asset in 40 minutes with chemical weapons all that stuff starts coming out right you look at what's been in the American press for like the last eight years. Oh, the president's in bed with Russia. Russia stole our democracy in the, in a, in the election. Ru oh, the Hunter Biden laptop story is Russian information. If you're, a Russian, if you're a Russian government minister, you kind of like, oh, fucking hell, I've seen this story before. And then all of a sudden, like when, when we're bringing in some of these NATO countries like Georgia, what do they bring to the table for NATO? Nothing except a forward operating base. And um, solely, so we have been encircling Russia, right? And uh, again, and you can make an it's argument. It's not just that. But it's, it's not, not just, just it's not just that, mate. That's what I'm saying. It's not just that. But to say that isn't a fact, to say that the way that America has been using Russia as the boogeyman and then taking in more places around its border, if that was happening, I mean, we've seen it happen to America. When, when Russia wanted to put missiles in Cuba, America said, if you don't take them out, we will have a nuclear war. So, I'm not, again, it doesn't mean what Russia did was right. But there's nothing happening right now that we have not done ourselves. Nothing. Well, no, we've not contributed to. You can, we've not. We've not done it 100. percent It's not our fault. It's like it's everyone's fault. The situation yes, we're in. Yeah. But going back to you know the you, you, the, the Ukraine thing. It's like I, if I go back to the whole like last 23 years. It's uh, it, it's such a. Do you know what? I find it such a depressing thing to talk about because it's so like I've literally invested years of my life in. What I'm now saying, <laughs> you know, yeah, I know, mate. Yeah, I know, and know people exactly. have literally invested their whole lives. They're not yeah. here anymore. Yeah, yeah. They don't exist anymore, mm -hmm. you know, because of it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's such a depressing thing to talk about. But I, I, I do think it is, it is purely down to. I mean, I, I tweeted it the other day. I, I, I think that, I think that, the way we are now, the West, right? Can't speak for like China, Russia, can't speak of anywhere else, but the West. It's like w capitalism has got its hooks in the way democracy works. It's got its hooks in politics. And capitalism is running politics, right? I'm not saying capitalism is bad, but what it means is like there is more advantage to a politician looking to make a decision based on how much money they can make and power they can get, as opposed to a politician listening to what their electorate wants. Of course. The electorate does not give the politician money. Well, I think... But the... it, and it, it, you, I think you can simplify what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying this yeah. is what I think is the case. Yeah. You can boil it down that simply. It is more beneficial for the majority of politicians to want to line their pockets, set themselves up, and make decisions that keep their political allegiances in check. Mm -hmm. And, jet, and then there is, it is a class thing as well. It is a class thing as well. To do with it and it's just but it's created by the relationship capitalism has with politics and i think it is because the control measures that exist within politics to protect politics and democracy from those things they're not fit for purpose anymore mm. they're not fit for, pur fit for purpose anymore like british government british parliament it is set up to run on a country in a state that it was 200 years ago not now not now. And we see ourselves in the situation we are now. And it's the same for America, I think. I mean, look in America, like the amount of money that they have to raise to run for office. So you can't get into office without getting into bed with those companies. And then you owe them. And this is kind of what we talked about last time, because I'm like, it's, I agree with you. Like this, it's a lot of this big business is driving this. And that's why we see 
you know, like that's why, like for instance, in lockdowns, no one was telling no one's who's, who's going to fucking tell Walmart to shut down in America. No one. Be the end of your career. Um, but you can go, but so it's like, well, well, we'll shut down other shops, but we won't shut down the big ones. So then, then, you know, you have that massive wealth transfer again from small shops, small, um, small, um, what would you call them? Um, small businesses to mega corporations. Um, why was that? Because like you said, there, there is, there, there isn't government and business. There's just government and business intertwined. They are one and the same. Um, there's the revolving door of this thing of, like I saw this uh, thing recently with the, you got the um, Federal Drug Administration and this revolving door of the same people who are granting um, kind of, um, um, oh, what, it, what would the word be? Um, you know, ba- basically allowing a drug to go on the market are then on Regulated. the, on the, on the, yeah. The, yeah, that's it, mate. Yeah. They're, 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 they're then on the board for one of the major companies. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, yeah, cheers, mate. Um, so <laughs> I poured off myself. <laughs> you passed it over to me. <laughs> Go on, mate. You're supposed to be a gracious host, but yeah, it's um, that's that's the kind of problem. And I don't know how I don't know, cheers, mate. I I don't know how we how we disentangle that. I don't think you can, guys. I don't think you can. Like uh, as 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 drastic as it sounds, I think it's such the way it is. It's like I, I really, I really think that uh, you, you, we need to like in an ideal world, like. You would just stop it. You go fucking stop what we're doing. <laughs> stop. Just stop. <laughs> okay, let's get some. You, you, you think about a business that's going pear shaped. Yes. Right? You go stop, stop. We're gonna and you get a ballsy. Excuse me. Excuse me. And you get a ballsy CEO. You get a ballsy MD or a ballsy board, and they go, "We have got problems here. Like, we can make a good thing of this, but we've gone the wrong way at some point down there. We've got something wrong. We're in a bad position." Let's get a third party in, consultancy in. We're going to pay them gazillions of pounds of money, mm-hmm. dollars of money. This is what happens. And the consultant comes in and goes, does an evaluation over weeks, months, whatever, months, years sometimes. And they go, here's the recommendations to how you should change, what you need to change. And here's a recommendation, the road plan to do that. It's not mm-hmm. going to be easy. It's going to take time. But this is how you do it. And this is how you sell it to your employees. Right, yeah. and why you want to do it. If this is your end game where you want to be, this is how you do it. Like in an ideal scenario, we do that with as with government mainly mainly government. Uh, so you can't change capitalism, right? It is the I think capitalism is a good thing, mm-hmm. but it's it's the influence it has on government that needs to change. Okay, mm-hmm. so you, that's what you do. You can't do that though, yeah. and because you can't do that. That's why things like revolutions happen. That's why things like you get failed states. That's why things like catastrophes, major economic catastrophes happen. And it sounds like grand and crazy. It's not. It's only like grand and crazy to like people who may be listening to this and thinking, what the fuck is you on about? It's only grand and crazy because we've not experienced it in our country in our lifetime. Think about how many other countries you've seen or read about in the news in your lifetime where this has happened, where countries go pear shit for a long time. America's on the cusp of it. We ain't far behind. If we're not if we're not careful, we ain't far behind. You've got how many countries in Africa are fucked? How many countries in South America are fucked? Argentina's been in a hole for 30 years, yeah. at least 30 years, because it all went pear shit. Go, Got, it, it, it ran away with itself, just pure corruption. And if people don't think that we are riddled with corruption in a really bad way, government is, and this isn't me saying like politicians are bastards, it is just the game. You mentioned Johnny earlier. It is just the game that they have to be forced to play to get to do what they want. I have no doubt, and Johnny won't mind me saying this and showing what, I have no doubt that Johnny makes decisions in government that he does not believe with, believe in. And he votes on things and he votes in a way that he doesn't want to vote. But he does it because he needs to achieve X, Y, or Z, other intention, other aim. And it, and it must fucking break him. Someone like, I've I like, you know, got a lot of respect for him. must break him. Other people doesn't break so much. You know, it's just the game we're in. You can't. I don't see how you change it. I mentioned earlier, like, about politicians and money and power. That's one aspect of it, right? It just making decisions to line their own pockets. It's not as conscious as that. It's not as nefarious as that. There's the other aspect is where you mentioned about like the the, the industries and the sectors and the organizations, companies with a lot of money. The other side to it is their efforts, their psyops, their lobbying, oh, yeah. their propaganda driven 
operations against the people who can make decisions in government yeah. and the civil servants. At least you buy sure, people and off. And there's, I'm sure, because you know. the other thing as well is we're all fucking human, right? So exactly. I'm sure every single politician has a skeleton, which is probably used against them um, when it comes to these things. So they're not going to play nice, are they? But one of the things I think, and we kind of touched on this last time we talked, is we elect our politicians you know, based on kind of what's going on at the time. When we elected our current crop of politicians, we didn't know about COVID. We didn't know about um, Ukraine. Now it's fair. It's fair enough to say when a, when a, you know, when a big event first happens, they got to do what they got to do. But we're over a year into Ukraine. Obviously, we went through a few years of COVID. At some point, you have to go take the only way to disentangle from from the the kind of like let's call them the power players who are really calling the shots. The only way to disentangle from that is to have referendums and to say, for instance, so let's say by the summer, it was quite obvious what was going on in Ukraine. You put it to the people. Um, you, one of my friends calls this digital democracy, right? Um, and you, know, you put it <laughs> Hang to... Hang on. I coined that phrase on this very podcast. You can't steal that from me. I said one of my friends. You can't steal that from me. I said one of my friends. Who has it said it? I need to shoot him. I said this years ago. I said ago. one of my friends. Are you yeah. not my friend? Because I'll fucking leave it, mate. <laughs> yeah. You got me. I drove two yeah. and a half hours down here for you. I had a lengthy conversation with Gaz Walsh about this on the podcast. All right. Well, this was I think my friend Tom Wilkinson. So I'm going yeah, to put, you, put you two. I'm going to put you two in a room, mate, and we'll have a battle royale. Win against the name. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, like maybe we're not there yet, but that should be what we're striving for of major issues the where we can like. And look, the thing is, and and again, you mentioned psyops. Most people probably would, because um, I think a lot of us kind of, like, if you didn't realize it at the time, probably can admit it now, that the psyops going off during COVID were off the scale. Um, and, you know, like, look at the Ukraine stuff. Nobody talks on the news about, well, a bit of NATO encroachment, and no one's talking about that, are they? And, and to be fair, you know, the, the, the salient point is Putin invaded the sovereign nation. That is the salient point. But, you know, there's no... There's no in-depth, balanced discussion about, well, why? So, for instance, you know, we can look at our invasion of Iraq and say that it was wrong. But at the same time, you can't say that there was no justification for it. Because there was. The guy was fucking evil, murderous bastard. And having him out the thing and on the end of a rope was a good thing for a lot of people. Yeah, but... but but, but, but how many other countries are in, the, in that situation uh, we don't go exa into? That's exactly what I was going to say. Um... When the uh, International Criminal Court the other day issued an arrest warrant for Putin, for all right, where's the one for Bush and Blair? Yeah. Um, but America don't even recognize it. I say, oh, there's actually a funny one the other day. I say funny, it's just like funny as in like you got to laugh or you'll cry. Um, they started to build this kind of war crimes case or whatever against um, you know what's going on with the Russian troops, and they uh, this was I think some people in the U.S. government and the Pentagon blocked it because they're like, if you fucking open this kind of worms, this opens up uh, us up for all kinds of fucking things. Because we do fuck up. Like, a lot of the stuff that we do is bad. Now, I, I, I have friends who've been out in Ukraine. There, there, There is, and I this is something I think we can be proud of as the British military, we don't go rounding people up and fucking murdering them. And when people do that, they get prison. And I think that's how it should be. I think we should hold ourselves to that high standard. So we're fucking professional soldiers at the end of the day. You should act like a fucking professional. Murdering a prisoner is not professional. Um... But I think it's very so. I can. I'm going to bring things back to the book. Um, one of the things that happened at the very end of the evacuation, obviously after the suicide bombing, I think there was this real sense that America needed to strike back, so that they weren't leaving with taking people without kind of doing something and hitting back. So they took out a family, because this guy, the intelligence they had was he passed through an area that was known for like there was ISIS case. So he'd gone through the area in a white Toyota Corolla. Now, anyone who's been to Afghanistan, <laughs> well, no, that is like saying, I don't know, it's like... It's, it's like, like saying an Audi A4 yeah. in the UK. Like yeah. a, a black and, Audi like, A4 yeah. in the UK. I mean, and, and, a and, oh, and so they reckon that the guy that did the suicide bomb might have had a laptop case. So this guy had a laptop case and he had a Corolla, fucking drone strike. Um, and also, I think one of the worst things was they saw, th uh, oh, I think it was like three, they had three minutes of feed beforehand where it was quite clear that there was kids around the car. And they took this guy out and his family, absolutely no, admit, like not even administrative action. The people who were behind it actually are now in higher positions. Now that is not holding ourselves to professional standard. Um, that I think that strike was incredibly politically motivated. 
it was we wanted because they sold it as yeah we took out an ISIS thing. There's never anything to say that he was ISIS, um, and we we included parts of the official kind of debrief, the Pentagon um, reports and stuff like that on it. It was a fucking execution of an innocent family, and I the people that, behind that should be behind bars. Yeah, I think that. Uh, I mean, on that, like, I think you have situations like that where. <laughs> I think the the more layers of military command you remove between the trigger puller mm. and the politician, the the easier it is to achieve things like that. So you think about, back to your example, you know, we both served in places where, fucking hell, I probably had thousands of opportunities to kill people. Mm. Potentially could have got away with it. Potentially. Oh, I say got away with it. No, thousands of opportunities to kill people, right? Probably would never have got away with it because I would have been held. I pulled over the calls by my, by whichever my 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 one up was, whoever my commander was at the time. I didn't do it because because I knew I'd be dragged over the fucking car. Well, one, I didn't. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's not really you didn't do it. I, I didn't do it. No, I would have got away I with it too. Wasn't no, no, no. even meddling. Kids. I didn't do it one because I'm, obviously you're not supposed to fucking do it. But another reason is like it, the, the deterrent of oh I'll get fucking pinged. Like Jesus Christ, it sounds bad. But yeah. if I had been that person who wanted to do that, right? Now that you move those away. It, I, know, I, know, I need to rephrase that. Oh, <laughs> fucking hell. Um, but when you get to things like drone strikes, there's so few layers. This the connection between the trigger puller, the the pilot, the trigger puller of the weapon system, right, and the politician or the not the politician. What's the other word? The well, they have lawyers that have to sign off. Yeah, on yeah, it. yeah. Right. This I, is. I have someone very, 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 very close to me mm. who is a podcast listener. Who is one of those people? All right, shout out to them. Hopefully, you yeah. weren't involved in this one, mate. No, not take it back if you were. Please keep listening. <laughs> not involved in this one. No, not involved in this one. Um, but uh, go back to my point. Very few layers between people who fly predators and the, and the, the drones that can create strikes. And what's the word? Not, well, I, not I don't blame the crew for this one at all. I, I blame. I don't blame the trigger puller because they got told to pull the trigger. Did right. I really sound like the only reason I didn't go killing civvies is because... I mean, we all knew that anyway. I think your <laughs> listeners know who you I, are. Like we joke and I'm fucking... You, oh, we, I think we, we, know, we know who you yeah, really yeah, are, mate. <laughs> they can see the, they see it in the eyes. Yeah. Um, I'll, but see, mate, but, I'll yeah, see you in court so, in about six months' time. But the thing with this one is... Um, I think as well, this you could have accepted this. Let, so let's say, for instance, it was a white Corolla speeding towards the airport and there was kids in it and the kids were unfortunately killed. You'd be able to have a little bit more leeway. This was a guy getting out, going into his house, and it was fucking something like three miles from the fucking airport. So there's no, there's no imminent threat. There's what was the no... reason they struck him then? Because he was in a white crawler with a laptop bag. Nah, mate, on, more to it, guys. Mate, on, no, guys, mate. Guys. I wish to, I wish I could say that there was more, but this is, this is from their own, this is from their own fucking briefing where basically they said that they got confirmation bias. Which was, they were like, oh, this is the same as the guy at the gate. He's in a Corolla. Because they'd had some intelligence reports ah. to say Corolla. So but they were that like, must be him three kilometers away. Yeah, but I think there's yeah. something like, I forget the numbers now. In Kabul, there's something like 700,000 Corollas. <laughs> something like that. Oh, they're everywhere. Yeah. But, and, so he might have, he probably drove through the wrong area. They picked him up, tailed him, whacked him. But even if he was, let, let's say, even if you did think that he was the guy, why are you hitting him at the time when he's surrounded by kids? Like, you know, where's the, you know, quote unquote, courageous restraint in that? Because the thing is, like, as soldiers, those, those, those American servicemen that gave their lives at the gate, they signed up to put their lives at risk for the lives of other people. That's what they did. And that's what they did end up doing. You know, I don't think any of us sign up because we want to fucking whack a family who are three miles away. And, and we, like, if someone said to you, like, look, lads, um, there might be a fucking suicide bomber threat. We've seen a guy get out of a car. He's surrounded by kids. Do you want to take him out or not? I think the blokes will go, no, it's not, not you get the wrong person. Do. You get the wrong person on a weapon system. As in, you get, very, you get a few people. They're our rarities, right? And they end up in the, wrong per- yeah. in the wrong place and they have access to a weapon system and they can do something bad, right? Very rarely is that someone who's behind a, a handheld weapon system because, back to my point, even if you fucking could do it, you wouldn't get away with it. You wouldn't get away with it. You wouldn't get away with it, right? Unless you're some, unless you're fucking SF operating on your own, a very small team somewhere, and somehow fucking covered it all up. Whatever, right? But it it does. You get people in bad position. You get people in bad bad positions. I can tell you some fucking stories where I've seen things very very close to happening. And you go, there was. You want to do what? No, you should not be do like you should not be making that call based on that information. It's fucking wild, but. You get it, and and 
you also get it, like in that example you gave me there, that could have been so many, so many as simple as the wrong people in the wrong place or not great, not great people at their jobs in the wrong place mm -hmm. and looking for a good news story exactly. in a real shit storm going down. Exactly. Oh yeah, this happened, uh, but we got a, we hit, we got a great target. We hit a target, took this guy out. Or we think it was him, and here's the, here's the evidence, and people's not paying attention to the evidence, uh, or the val the the like validating whether it actually was that high value target or not, because they're concentrating on the hundreds of thousands of people trying to get out of Kabul and the tens of thousands of troops in yeah. real danger. Yeah? I think I think you bang on, mate. It's a good news story. Just before we move on, mate, where did you get that necklace of ears that's hanging up on the wall over there? <laughs> <laughs> She war crimes Kia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Colchester. Right, you're a little break, mate. <laughs> you need a piss? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah we got about 30 minutes. Right, we're back. We're back. Blood is emptied. Um, where were, oh, man, we were all depressing stuff then. I say depressing. I said, let's talk about rugby. It's such a, <laughs> do you know what? In, in serious, right? It, in, in, all, in serious, in all seriousness, it's like, it's such a difficult... I always feel not worried. I'm always just in my back of my mind, oh God, I've been talking about this kind of stuff. And as soon as you mention as well s certain phrases like industrial military complex or, you know, uh, anything to do with money influence and the reason we're doing things, if, even just now, as soon as you start mentioning Ukraine, in anything other than full support of Ukraine. No, mate, I'll, I'll come back to it. I'm just leaning back. People back don't hear my heavy breathing. Oh, I sound like a, I sound like a, a really sorry. horny Labrador when I'm next to Um... It's just difficult to navigate the topics, but I say navigate it. It's difficult to talk about it. A a anything other than just full support for what is the norm, which is just it's just not the case anymore. I think there's definitely like the world. My under my 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 understanding of the world over the last few years has drastically changed. Drastically changed. Did you take the red pill? Yeah, no, no, you know, I, well, you know, you what see, I did was. But it's like that thing is that matrix thing, you, know, you take I, the pill, once you see the matrix, it's like. What I did was, it's like, you know, it's like, uh, what I did was, I realized that the blue pill I've been taking all my life, and those experiences it gives me and my understanding of the world may not be wholly the way the world works. It's like, you know, it'd be like taking mushrooms. And then, and then, and thinking the world is the way the, what, what's the, the, mushroom, mushroom, the way the world is the way I see not it. Not familiar with, <laughs> not familiar with this drug abuse. But um, no, it's drastically changed. And in that, I, I don't take everything I see on the news as as whole truth, nothing but the truth, all the time. For example, I don't see. I used to see every. I used to be such such a. I always wanted to see the positive in everything, especially with government. Mm. I always wanted to think that even if it was a bad situation happened, that there was some good reason behind it or a decision made, especially with the personality. I don't think that's the case now. And there's definitely, there's definitely things going on that just don't, don't add up in, in terms of the reasons that things are being done and not the reasons we be, we're being told. And, I, and the main reasons I think that is I look over all the things I've been involved with. Yes. That yes. 20, you know, 20, 23 years I first had experience of. And all of the information that's comes out that has come out since about those things, I'll go back to Iraq. I'll go back to Iraq very early on. The reason we went to Iraq was primarily because of the threat of WMDs and, and the attack on the West from Iraq. That was primarily what we were told the reason was. And we know, and we knew 10, 15 years after that, there were no WMDs. Mm -hmm. there, there literally were none. And we also know that the the governments at the time knew there were none, yes. but they're saying they were there. They used a few sketch maps. And that's off, so why we went in. They, they right? used a few sketch maps off a, exactly. an asset and based everything off of that. It's crazy. So that that outright fucking lie, mm -hmm. right, in one situation, and I'm just, as in the one situa situation I'm describing there, that has happened decades, over the decades before, mm -hmm. In America, in the UK, but with John in America, different things, and it is happening now, and has happened over the last twenty years. Yeah, the reasons we go and predominant, mainly military things, the reason we go and do them, and we're told we're going to do them, is not really the reason we're doing them, and the threat that we're being told comes from these places to us, to validate why we're going and intervening in these places, is not really that threatening at all. Yeah, and and those are facts. Those are facts, Ex right? Exactly. And and the thing is, mate, that's when you really kind of start to question 
are we the baddies, you know, to kind of use that meme, um, you know, the, that like that from that taken from that kind of like the sketch with the SS guys. Well, um, but I... but what I was going to say is, mate, because like if there was a good reason, they'd use it. So you only have to lie when you haven't got a compelling case, right? If you've got a compelling case, if if it was a real compelling case, you wouldn't need to lie. So once you start lying your way into something, then then all of a sudden you're like you probably don't actually have legitimacy, kind of for your cause. And the, like to kind of um, echo what you're saying there. When I started to question me, because me I was very much Tory to the bone, like you know, God, you know, God bless the Queen, fucking rule Britannia and everything like that. And I will Thank say, and God. I will say this: one, I do actually love the Queen. And two, oh I'm very proud to be British. I do think, and I've said this before on the podcast, and I'll keep saying it, because people always say, oh, you don't like Britain, go and live somewhere else. I fucking love Britain. We live in one of the best countries in the best times of all history. I believe that. Um, and that's why I want to keep it that way, because like you were saying, like, you know, if you don't change things, then you will all of a sudden have a, you know, a revolution. And I, I like to bring Johnny back up. I, I have apologized to Johnny. I said, when I, you know, when we do have to hang all the politicians, I said, there will be tears in my eyes. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> cause I love him. But, um, you know, it's, um, for me, it was when we, when we left Basra in 2007 and all the media, um, all the media and, um, government portrayal, I mean, it's rums very good, by the way. Or it might just be all that nicotine and stuff. But um, when we... I don't know shout to Cy Piles. Cy Piles and, uh, and um, Gav Tuak brought this in. Sea Dog, Sea Dog Rum. Yeah, shout out to them because it's, yeah. it's, it is lovely. Um, but when we left Basra, we left having made a deal with the militias. I know, I think we talked about this on the first episode we did with each other. But we left having made a deal with the militias. Didn't tell the Iraqi government. Left the city basically in the middle of the night, like we, like it was like we just like like that we were doing the walk of shame out of there. But you know we turned up at the we turned up at the um, the airbase. We had the flags flying off the warriors, and the press was successful handover to local forces. And um, I'll tie this back tie this back in with Kabul. We should have known better because we did it in Basra. What happened when we left Basra? Anyone that worked with us murdered. What happened? The Iraqis, uh, the Iraqis had to send their kind of crack division down with with the Yanks, and like, mate, you, you understand the pride that you have um, as a soldier, and I know as a member of the Reg, you know, you have extreme pride in your regiment. As a soldier, to accept that someone else had to come in and finish doing your fighting is just, and, and not because they need to, because we were told, like, we didn't want to fucking leave. I'm sure. Okay, I'm, I say I'm speaking for everyone here, but I know a lot of us did not want to pull out of Basra. We we wanted to be let off the leash. We were on fucking card alpha. We were like, put us on four two nine and let us go. That's what we wanted, mate. But instead, we had to leave. The Americans had to come in the next year on Operation Charge of the Knights. And um, I do think that this is this is a book I really want to start working on in the next couple of years and co covering this. Um, but you know, that to me was when I was like, hang on. The reality of what's happening here, it's not just that there's a gloss on it. The news is a different, like, this is a fabrication, a total fabrication. That happened in 2007. So that's when I got a very healthy kind of distrust of, of, um, of the news. And I think, you know, like this, uh, the kind of part of the problem of, of this stuff is that Unfortunately, there's a lot of people, for instance, use COVID as an example. There's some people who go right off the deep end. Oh, vaccinations are they gonna they're putting chips in you and it's all <laughs> of this stuff. And unfortunately, if you question the norm, as you said, you then become you're you're not cast in with, oh, this person's just looking at this with based on history and based on their own experiences, they think Bill Gates is putting chips in everyone. You know, and it's the same with Ukraine. People think like our podcast, Fashion State of Mind. Um, when we started talking about the reasons that Russia had, not legitimate reasons, but let's say if you were looking at it from a Russian point of view, we lost half our followers on the podcast because people didn't want to hear the other side of the argument, which is like, look, we've not got clean hands in this. You know, like American, American diplomats were recorded during the revolution in Ukraine deciding who they were going to put into office. 
people don't want to hear things like that. They want a very clear black and white thing. So I, I ran some polls on the um, veteran state of me, veteran state of mind social media, and we got a good few hundred answers. So we had a decent sample size, and it was basically like um, the questions were, you know, was Iraq a sovereign nation? Yes. Um, you know, did did were the reasons that we went there true or false? False. You know, almost hundred percent of people said false. Then it, and then it was, you know. And the, but, and, but there's okay. a problem with this poll. Go on. Well, you're asking the people who follow Veteran State of Mind. And the people who follow Veteran State of Mind uh, okay. are people who are mostly in Cons line with what you think. Conspiracy theorists who put things Bill Gates <laughs> and slips in people. No, no but, 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 yeah, but uh, mate, of course, and that's a problem with any poll. Is is always like who's who you actually? Not if you select the uh, the, the the what you call it the the sample pool. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but almost every poll you can have a, a ski, like it's it's very hard to have a it's very hard to have like that kind of on social media. Poll. Yeah, yeah, because how do you find how do you find that, how, how do you find that broad yeah, group of people? Yeah. You know, like most most of these polls are like you go and put people. It's like it's like Joe Rogan always says, who's answering the phone to do? Yeah, a poll? I saw one from YouGov the other day. Right, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on. Sorry, to interrupt. I saw one from YouGov the other day. And it was, I can't remember what it was saying. I can't remember. It said something like 71% of the UK public, blah, blah, blah. I was like, hmm. I, because being the spotter I am, <laughs> right? And it's, uh, was it two years ago now? I went and put myself through a, a YouTube course. Now it was like eight hours, eight or 10 hours, like six modules, but it was all about statistics. So how do you understand and interpret statistics, right? But, you don't even need to do that, do that course to understand this. I went and looked at it. Seventy one percent of the British public. I thought, okay, let's have a look at what the yeah. how, do you know how many people they surveyed? Seven thousand people. <laughs> and seven thousand people, seventy one percent of the seven thousand people they surveyed said X, Y, Z thing. So they said, Yeah, that's representative of the UK public because we we interviewed a broad range of households from different classes and different races and different ethnic backgrounds and different blah, 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 blah. And that's their conclusion. Yeah. But the headline, 71% of the British public. Yes, blah, blah, blah. Exa mental, exactly. Mental. No, go back, I, I, I go totally, back to your... Uh, I totally agree. Mind but basically, then I was like, <laughs> do, do, but, and then I was like, do you, you know, do you, because they, you know, they'd kind of agreed, they'd agreed, bullshit reasons, invasion of a sovereign nation, do you view Russia's invasion of Ukraine in the same way that you view America and Britain's invasion of Iraq? And it was like 90% no. And I asked people, I was like, if you said yes, why? If you said no, why? And a lot of the, the reasons why people didn't look the same, people were honest about it. And they were like, I just can't bring... I don't think you get on, that. On, sorry, 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 sorry. They were basically saying, I just can't bring myself to admit that we were in the wrong for what we did. It's too hard. And I think that that's a big part of things because you and me, mate, we probably overthink us. We probably, we probably like to dwell in this horrible darkness too much. Um, I don't like it. I hate, I, no, I, 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 I do not like it in, get, in discussing my, it. My, I, my, my, I don't want to know the answer. I don't want to. I don't want to look at the, what it could possibly be. Exactly, mate. And I, I think that the way I get around that is to be honest, mate. And this is a terrible thing to say, but then again, I am a terrible human being. If somebody said to me, like, look, total bullshit reasons we're going in this country, but guess what? It's going to be an armoured battle group. You're going to have challenges. You're going to have warriors. You're going to have Apaches. Uh, do you want to go? Fuck yeah, I want to go. Oh, who was so, I talking to about this? So yeah. this is why. I can I can kind of just go like, look, I never bought... I ne and to be honest, mate, I actually... And this is not... I, I'm, I have my journal from the time when we were in Afghan. This isn't when I look back on Afghan with hindsight. I was talking about this stuff 2009 when we were there. Um, but I want to be a jimpy gunner in Afghan. I knew I knew that we weren't really helping the locals, but I got to help myself to some fucking jimpy action, and that's what I wanted, and that was a very selfish you, thing to did do. Did you think that at the time you I were didn't, helping? I didn't, mate. I, see, I, no, I didn't. It was because you were young and naive, mate. So what, what about when you, so you just went out there to drop those thousands of people? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I went out there because I was told to go out there. If you, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot recently. Right. It's like, why did, why do, why do we go? People go, why do you go out there? Um, and 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 I think about it in the same way as why didn't I, why don't we question whether we should be there or not as a military person? Mm. Right, I never did that once when I went. Mm. You don't go. So where are we going? We're going to Afghanistan. We're going to Iraq. Okay. Do I think we should go and get off philosophical? You know. And one, I think because you we, condi we can, yeah. not conditioned, but you, you don't. Two is because no, I wanted to go. And the reason being is, I was being told to go, number one. Mm -hmm. 
And number two, like Iraq, when Iraq came up, right? And we got told we're going to Iraq. Fucking hell, mate. I was so happy. Mm. I was so happy when I got told we were going to be invading Iraq uh, in a couple of months later. Um, and I was so happy because I was like, oh my God, I've joined up. The first few years me shit, like Northern Ireland, crap, mm. crappy fucking exercise. It was just a, it was a shit time for the British military, as in terms of, in inverted commas, job satisfaction. You weren't doing anything cool, right, in terms of you weren't doing proper soldier stuff. Then when we got told that, I was like, oh, my God, I am going to war. Literally, I remember thinking it, oh, my God, I'm going to war. This is fucking awesome. Mm. You know, in my naivety in an ignorance of what war or what battle actually is, I mean, though I know what it is now, it's not very nice, you know. Uh, but back to your point about, you know, going out to Afghan being a gym together. Oh, who was I talking to about this? In Ukraine. Uh, you know, there was opportunities to go out to Ukraine, go out there over, over the last year, mm -hmm. being asked to go out and take part in things, to be a part of the effort out there in different roles, like war fighting roles. Mate, of all the things we've just been talking about now, right? If I was single and I did have a family, right? And I had no major commitments, or even if I did over here, but I didn't have any kids to worry about, I didn't have a partner, I'd be like, yes. Would you? I wouldn't be, I would, mate. I'd be, no, I, as in I'd be giving it serious thought. Okay. Like, right. get me yeah. fucking over there. Fucking right. Because put me back into that place where I know I'm great. You know, that, those mm -hmm. situations where I yeah. know I'm great. And it would be, it, it would be a, a serious conversation in my head, yeah. you know, and and and, uh, and and that that's like the the sort of the, not the paradox, it's the what you call it, yeah, the the, the conflicting thoughts between one hundred percent, like your 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 evolutionary male like tendencies and. Toxic masculinity. Not toxic masculinity, <laughs> but you know. No, uh, I know. I know what you mean, mate. The, the warrior kind of culture to, and just. Yeah. Well, let, let me ask you then, mate. Let me ask you. I want to talk about your I, film. Hang on, but let me let me ask you this though. We can we can uh, like because this would be this would be interesting. Um, okay. Knowing what you know about Iraq now, mm. if this was now, if 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 young Hugh Key, and that was the other the thing I was going to say as well is when we do all this stuff, we're young, and you don't think about stuff as yeah, the same no, no, when you're no, younger. No, no. Yeah. Um, but knowing what you know now. Would you do the invasion again? So, so I'm eighty. I'm oh, twenty-one actually. I'm twenty-one, and I know what. So, what do I know? You know what you know now. You think what you think now. Would you do it again? So, Hugh, we're going in. You know what you know now. You're twenty-one. You're in a twenty-one-year-old body. Your knees are great. There's no creaking. Your back's fine. <laughs> do you want to go back? Well, no, not if I know what I knew now. Ah, it's interesting. That's interesting. No, I think because because I've like it's it's a question of morality and ethics, right? And you, you make your moral decisions, and ethical decisions based on the knowledge you have to hand. And so I went in then and didn't say no because I thought it was the right thing to do. I wasn't even questioning it. I wasn't even questioning it. So you weren't thinking it's the right thing. You just think it's the thing, literally. I, I'm There's okay. Right, I'm, in right, 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 you know. I'm in the army. I'm in the army. Mm -hmm. I'm being told to go there to do this thing. Okay, I'm going. Oh, by the way, this is fucking cool. I'm going to war. Yeah. So yeah. I, was in a, I was in a different position, mate, because I had to volunteer to do my tours because obviously I did them through the back door through the TA, didn't I? And then I stayed on. If you, so, could, you could flip it round. You could flip yeah. it round and say, we got conscripted in now. Imagine we got con called up now because it's the same scenario but a more realistic one. We get called up now, conscripted in because your career has gone pear shaped. They need to send 100,000 soldiers to Ukraine otherwise the world's going to implode and we've been called up because we haven't got 100,000 soldiers anymore we've been called up to go in we're going to say no aren't we no I'm going to say yeah but I'm, I'm not going to shave my beard <laughs> I'm not cutting my hair and I'm wearing mixed cam so the, so it's like basically I'll go but you'll be our guy in me every day <laughs> and I'm not filling any fucking sandbags basically you can stick me in a sanger with a gym pee. I'm not digging any trenches my back hurts what's um, this movie you're involved in uh, movies. Can we get off the? Can we get off the? Yeah, let's talk about something. I, I want to talk about rugby, mate. Oh yeah, no, I just said it's off the doom and gloom. <laughs> no, the, hey, mate, that French game was not doom and gloom, mate. I seen, I got a ray of hope now. Mm. Four tries yeah. against France, mate. Come on, yeah, come on. As a yeah. fellow Welshman, mate, yeah, well, I, I was expecting us to get beaten no, by thirty we points. Should smash everyone, mate. We we should. Unfortunately, okay, actually, let's flip this. The last twenty years, in terms of war, has been quite depressing. We had the golden age of Welsh rugby. The last period, and now unfortunately, because I, I blanked out all those early games I went to as a kid in the Arms Park, I blanked them all out, 
And all I could remember was the Grand Slams. We have and not the had the gold, mate. Actually, thinking about the gold, yourself. The no, gold we age, mate. No, we haven't. How many we... Grand Slams? What, in the last, how long? The last 15 years. Oh, how many Grand Slams? Really we had at least three. Yeah, in 15 years, guys. Yeah, that's, not, that's no gold age, mate. That it, is, is, it, it, is, no. It, is, it is compared to the 90s. What? We were in the nineties. We won fuck all, and we got and we and look. Let's be honest. Everyone knows we'd have won a World Cup if that fucker Alan Rowland hadn't fucking given Sam Warburton a red card. Oh right. That would have been our World Cup. So I count that as a World Cup. We won a World Cup. Um, you know, we've, no, it was Wayne Barnes. No, it was, it was Alan Rowland, mate. Jen. No. Eyebrows. It was Wayne Barnes. Eyebrows. Nah. Eyebrows. It was Wayne Barnes. I, eyebrows. It. Eyebrows. It. Uh, For anyone who doesn't Sam know, eyebrows Warburton. means if Hugh's wrong and he's going to be, he's got to shave Whoa. his eyebrows off. So I haven't agreed to it. Patreons, Sam please Warburton. hold him to account here. Cancel your subscriptions if you won't shave your eyebrows red off. Card, World Cup. Right. Sam Warburton, red card, World Cup. It was Wayne Barnes. It's Alan Rowland, mate. I remember because I fucking, I have a... I oh, have, shit. It's Alan Rowland, wasn't it? <laughs> Get them eyebrows off, kid. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, tell me about the film. The film, right. So, um... 2017, um, a friend of mine said, you got to meet this guy. He's just an absolute winner. Um, so this bloke, he was... And here a... we are. <laughs> and he won't even shave his eyebrows off. Well, she's on a bet. Um, he was a Green Beret. And um, then he went on to play uh, American football at the University of Austin, which is a really good program. Did have a scholarship. He was what you call a walk-on, which means that he basically went to trials, got himself a starting position on the team. Uh, and basically what he'd do is in the in the winter he'd play football and in the summer he'd go and do tours with the reserve Green Berets out in Afghan. Absolutely gleaming bloke. He and then when he was in um um when he got back when he finished all that, he went for trials in the NFL at the age of thirty four. So to give this context, most people that go into the NFL are twenty, twenty one, twenty two years old. He was thirty four, got onto the Seattle Seahawks, Brilliant. became yeah, I mean I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of listeners here who are, who are probably fizz monsters, really into the fizz. Everybody knows the difference in your physical capability at 34 compared to 21. So he got himself onto a team, uh, Seattle Seahawks. I think ESPN doc did a documentary about him. Um, and then he started this charity called uh, Merging Vets and Players because what he realized was um, athletes go through a lot of the same stuff as veterans do when they leave um, or well, you know when you, when you take the uniform off because they call their kids uniforms right, and basically you know one of the things a lot of us go through is for a lot of us we wanted to be soldiers since childhood that was our dream that's what we got to do you had all these if you were lucky enough and I do think we're lucky forget to do the tours that we did I feel very lucky for having them um, you've had some of the what you think is the high points of your life in your early twenties. And then you come out of you come out of service, and uh, you know a lot of the things when you have issues after leaving the military, people think, oh, it's because he saw his mate blown up or whatever. But a lot of the time, it's like you miss the brotherhood, you know, um, and that is exactly the same as a rugby team. You stop playing rugby, you miss that, um, you know, and like you know, to for these American footballers, for instance, from the age of like 15, 16, they're playing in front of thousands of people, you know, going on a play to college, they're playing on, you know, they're playing in front of like 80,000 people, playing in the NFL, 80,000 people. But the average career, even if you make it to the NFL, the average career is three years. So you're out by your mid 20s. Is that all it is? Three years three in the years. NFL. In, in, My in, God. In, the chances of making it to the NFL for, from college are tiny as it is. There's only 32 teams and they have a roster of about. Um, including the practice squad, I think about 60 people. So it's a tiny number of people that actually make the NFL. Most of them don't last three years. You know, because you've got some people pulling the average up because, you know, your Tom Brady's, etc. will do decades. You know, you'll get quarterbacks doing decades. But generally speaking, it's about three, five years. I'd love but, to go to an American football game. I'd love to go. Come with me sometime. It's, it's, it's a great experience. It's different to rugby, but it's like, I'm not just the game, the experience is different. I but, love watching it. But it's great. Yeah, mate, I'm yeah. the same. Big fan of it. But yeah, so they, they go through these. They go through a lot of the same things. They lose the team, they lose that. They lose the team atmosphere, the locker atmosphere, the brotherhood. They lose the adrenaline. They and they lose the sense of identity. So what Nate realized was that, especially in America, athletes look up to veterans and veterans look up to athletes. So he was like, I want to get them together for workouts. Okay. So they work out together, and then they sit around at the end and have a little bit of a, ch a chat, which obviously for a British person is very, like, you know, for us, we're very much like, oh, God, I'm not sitting in a circle and discussing my emotions and stuff. But I went along to one of these things, and I said to him, like, I was like, mate, there needs to be a film about this, you know. 
and I was staying. I was really lucky at the time. This was, this was you talk about golden ages. This was a golden age in my life. My mate used to let me use his mansion in the Hollywood Hills whenever he was out of town. So I was staying there. So he came up, sat by the swimming pool, wrote by, wrote this first script as we're like overlooking LA. It was fucking pretty awesome, really, mate. Like I'm now, I'm gonna make myself sad now because <laughs> <laughs> now I'm in Wrexham. <laughs> Now you're in so this, H-O this, is, this is how weird life is. It's like at Wrexham. The, at, at, the t- <laughs> at the time, I had no movie and I was in LA. Now I have a movie and I'm in Wrexham. So, although Ryan Reynolds does own Wrexham Football Club now, so you know oh, we yeah, do. Yeah, we yeah, have yeah. a touch of Hollywood. Yeah, Will yeah. Ferrell was there the other week at the race course. Um, so we, you know, we wrote this script, and then Nate, very much like Leveson, just gets places water can get. Um, and all of a sudden, we had Sylvester Stallone on board as an executive producer. And then, you know, obviously when I was in Hollywood, I was doing as you do in Hollywood and getting on it, let's say. So I was, I was, I was smashed. I got a text from Nate. He's like, we're meeting. We go to Stallone's house in the morning for a meeting. And I'm absolutely wasted. I'm like looking at my phone. I'm like, I've got five hours <laughs> till I go to Stallone's house. So first thing I did, dived in the cold swimming pool, <laughs> ordered an IV. Um, we did actually go in the end because he was filming Rambo at the time. He was filming over Rambo. We had uh, Braden Aftergood, who's made some of my favorite movies, Hell or High Water and Wind River. So he made those movies. So we had those guys on board. And, you know, for anyone that knows the NFL, um, we had Tony Gonzalez acting in the movie, best high end of all time. Uh, Michael Strahan was in the movie. So uh, NFL Network gave us their studios to film in, um, and also their anchors appeared as themselves on the show, oh, uh, on the film, sorry. Uh, we had Randy Couture, UFC Hall of Fame and a legend. He was in the movie. You meet any of these guys? Have, have, have I told you my Randy Couture story? No. Right. I fucking love Randy so, Couture. So, right, okay, so so this is, well, after this is, the film's already in production, right? So I go to Vegas, and I've been up for like three days, and I've got a flight to uh, Denver, and I'm the last person on the flight, and I have to step across person. This, this guy's sitting in his seat. I've got to step across him to get into my seat. He's got a flat cap on. I can't see his face. So I tap him on the shoulder and say, do you mind if I get near me? Looks up. It's Randy Couture. <laughs> so I sit next to him, and I'm like, oh, I'm Randy. Um, I wrote the MVP script with Nate and his stuff. He starts talking, and he goes, you okay, man? And I'm like, because like I was, my my head was all over. Like, I was woozy. I was in. I was a mess. I'm being a bad three days, mate. I mean a sesh. And um, he, he was like, get some sleep, brother. And like, because I was like, literally falling asleep. I was like, I can't believe I was sat next to Randy Couture. Got a three hour flight, and I can't stay awake. We land on the other end. Gently shakes me awake. Are you okay, man. I'm like, I'm okay. And he asked me about the weekend and stuff. And we walked through the airport together, chatting and things. And he slept. And I was like. That was a surreal moment because I used to watch UFC all the what time. What a legend, mate. All what a legend. But he's, that mate, he's, bloke such is. A, he's such a nice bloke. And he was in the movie. Um, so Nate made the movie um, on a shoes portraying budget, shot it during COVID when LA was like in lockdown and everything. But we had, we just got so lucky because people let us film in their mansions. <clears throat> um, Jay Glazer, who owns Unbreakable Gym, um, uh, where people like Chris Pratt go, he let us film there. Wiz Khalifa did us a song for free. Um, yeah. No way. Yeah. Yeah. Like it was just mental. So we had this film come out and, um, premiered in the States in September. So I went out for the premiere and at the same time, it's kind of really weird actually. Cause I'm already in my head. Like we're flying, I'm flying in, you know, as you land in LA, if you're sitting on the right hand side of the aircraft, you can see the Hollywood sign and stuff. So I'm like, fucking hell, I can't believe I'm flying in Hollywood to see a film that I've written. This is really surreal. And then I get there, and there's wrecks and billboards and wrecks them on the side of all the buses because the Hulu show that Ryan Reynolds did is now coming out. So I'm like, I'm definitely living in a computer simulation. Here. <laughs> I was like, there is absolutely no way. Of all the places, right? Of yeah. all the places, wrecks them. Yeah. He buys wrecks them. Because I was saying, I was saying a movie driver, I was like, see that sign? And he's just like, I'm like, mate, it's wrecks them. And like, he's obviously not getting it. But I'm just like, Wrexham all over Hollywood. I just couldn't believe it. Mate. We went to the premiere, <laughs> and obviously, like I was, because I was uh, ahead of time. I was like, oh, I've got like six hours to kill. I was like, I'll have a drink, and like I was so excited. I had a few drinks. I got there. I was fucking smashed. And um, we, we we watched the film, mate, and it was it was a bit nerve wracking at first because you just we had a lot of people in the audience who were veterans. And that was the kind of at the end of the day, if there was one audience I wanted it to do well with, it was it was veterans. Um, and it is like American veterans, British veterans do have a lot in common with each other. But hang on, something sounded a bit weird here, mate. Can you hear a bit of an echo? 
my headphones. Really? Yeah. Oh, it's come off this. Oh. Yeah. So if there's one one thing that one thing that like you know we we have a lot in common with American veterans, but there is a bit of difference as well. They are a bit more kind of um, I'm not gonna say proud of their service, but a bit more. Over. It's, it's, al- it. it's almost a bit more of a religion, and if you know what I mean, there's almost a holiness to it. Um, and so that's you know we wrote it for an American audience, and it was surreal seeing it on the big screen. And um, what really made it worthwhile was at the end there was a panel. Um, Nate was on there with a couple of the actors. And also there was um, this lady who, she was the brother of a Marine that, that Nate knew who took his own life. And she got up and started speaking and she was like saying, basically, she was like, you know, this, she said, I never understood why he did what he did. But when I watched this movie, it made sense to me why he did what he did. And it made her not have closure because, I mean, you're never going to get closure on your brother taking his own life. But... It, and it, she was, she had all these questions about why did he do it, and she kind of understood it after that. And to be honest, mate, once she said that, I was like, even if no one else likes the fucking film mm. at this point, that was worth it, you know, for me to do that. So I felt very lucky to have been a part of that, you know. And it's available in America uh, on Amazon, uh, Showtime, the network they 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 picked it up, so it's available on Showtime. If you want to watch it in the UK, you'll have to use a VPN and set it to. America, it's not available for distribution here. Um, but it was just awesome to be a part of, mate. Great learning experience. Um, do you want to do what? You know, Movies. I mean, mate, watch your space. That's all, <laughs> I, that's all I'll say on that one. Um, I actually got very close to selling a TV show uh, at the beginning of COVID, which well, I'll tell you the full story off air. But um, th- th- that is what I want to do. I want to be doing film and screen. Um, and that is what I will do. If I, you know, Generally quite good if I say I'm going to do something, I'll do it. So... Have you... I need to connect you up with Gareth Ellis Unwin. Go on, mate. You know what I'm on about? Yeah. Oscar winner. Fine. Oscar winner producer. I so he... he... That, that's, more, that's even better. <laughs> I interviewed him recently. Really? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 we first... We became mates when, when Kajaki was being filmed. He's an exec ah, right. producer from Kajaki. But he won an Oscar um, for producing The King's Speech. Right. Awesome. Uh, but he is... So he he... One of the things he does is... He's got a senior position at a thing called Screen Skills, which is basically upskilling people to go and make movies. Mm. And he came on and interviewed him recently because veteran community, trying to hit into the veteran community. He's vet, vet, is he? No, he's not. But he did Kajaki. Since Kajaki, he's got a oh, really see, tight in, really cool. or wants to, or is, he's emotionally connected to the, the yeah. veteran community. Uh, so I'll cut you up with him, mate. Mate, thank you. And that's yeah. that's one thing good I guy, say about guy. the movie, mate, is people bent over backwards to help us on it. You know, mm. I mean, people really do um, want to help you succeed. Um, and people really do give a fuck about veterans. And um, yeah, I mean, when the movie came out, because there's five years between writing it and watching it. So obviously there was a part of me, like the first time I watched it, all I could see was the mistakes that I'd made. You know, because I'm like, oh, fucking hell, I should have, that was a bad line, I should have done that okay. differently. But, I mean, that's how it should be. You shouldn't look at something you did five years ago and be happy with it, you know. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's cool, mate. And, um, yeah, we've got some more stuff in the works at the moment. Um, a few things, actually. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was just, a, it was a great experience, mate, to be part of something like that. And it, and it meant, you know, so there was this homeless shelter in um in the middle of hollywood a uh, homeless shelter i say i shouldn't say homeless shelter but uh, um, why shouldn't you say homeless shelter because it sounds a little bit mean it's, I, I know people some people don't like that term right but i mean at the end of the day these people were homeless and they were in this but it's for it's called the barracks and it was for veterans only right in the middle of hollywood and um <clears throat> you know it was kind of telling the, the guy's story and the, the guys that were actually kind of the ones that we loosely based the characters on they were happy with it, so that obviously meant a lot. And, um, you know, I, I think... I feel the same way about this Kabul book. You know, it's... I've done a lot of books now. I've done more than 20 books at this point. And um, there's some... I'm Look, I'm proud of them all, and I'm happy to have had the opportunity on all of them. But I'd be lying if I said some meant... You know, some, meant, so, some didn't mean more than others. You know, and the ones that mean more are the ones like MVP or like Escape from Kabul where you're actually telling someone's real story. And hopefully that will change a few people's 
it might validate some people about how they feel about themselves, which I think is important. And also it, it will help families of people who are there. So one of the things about, you know, it can be very difficult to talk to your family. So someone that was in Kabul, and this is one of the reasons I wrote Brothers in Arms, was just like that, that person that you're living with, the husband, the, the wife, the son, the daughter, they might not be able to talk to you about what they experienced. But, you know, if you can pick up a book and read someone else's that mirrors theirs, you will have a better understanding of that. And... Um, those those are the kind of projects that really kind of like you you leave them feeling like this this is more than a job you know this is like I haven't just done this for a paycheck this has been something where mate fucking we talk about it all the time as veterans purpose purpose is like um, this morning I woke up and I was like really excited to get out of bed and come down here and, and do this really excited You're being sarcastic no I did touch myself a little bit first. <laughs> Um, but generally, you know, but like that, we all know that feeling. There's mornings where you're lying in bed and you don't want to get out of bed because whatever you've got ahead of the day is not filling you with any kind of fire. And then there's those days where you can't wait to fucking fire out of bed in the morning. Do you know what I've realized re very recently? We're gonna wrap this up in a minute, but do you know what I've realized very recently? So I do, so some mornings I don't struggle out of bed, I get out of bed later than what I want to, mm -hmm. right. And I get I, I I like rising early. We're talking five five thirty, right? Right. That doesn't happen, or it's much less likely to happen if I don't have something I I have put on my list to do. The first thing I need to do, mm. as in like task one of the day. If I if I wake up in the morning and I it's not clear in my mind what I want to do, not necessarily what I need to, but I want to do. I've not gone to bed and think. I need to do this. This is the first thing. The first thing I'm going to do tomorrow is this. If I haven't done that, I'm very likely to get out of bed before maybe seven, seven thirty. Very unlikely. Uh, but if I if I go to bed and I say to myself right in the morning, to so task one in the morning, get up and do fucking hell, I don't know. It could be like sort of the walking out. It could be go boxing. It could be so if I set myself that. I'm I wake up in the morning. I'm in I'm in motivated mode get up i never get up and think oh i don't want to do that task as in whatever's in the day but the difference between and that that is purely from the military if i don't have a, if i don't know what i'm supposed to be doing even if i set it the task myself i get out of bed later i struggle to get out of bed i, str I struggle to get out of bed when i want to i like working i like getting up 5 five thirty. i like just getting up that early and making the most of the day and um if i haven't if i don't know what is on the mission for the day? I really, really, I just lay in bed. Like, see, fucking, I, see I, was, I was writing until bullshit. about three. Weird, I was, weird. I was writing until about three o'clock last night. And I could have kept going, but it was like no. And you obviously had to get up and you know in time to drive down here. But I'm not alert. I'm not a five thirty like you. But I, I'm a quite. I'm a bit of a night night owl. You're creative but, though. But, like Hannah yeah. Shergold, the uh, heard her interviewed her re yeah. recently. She she her art is all done through the night. She sleeps most of the day and she's painting yeah. all night. Yeah, I mean that's and I, I I don't know why that is. I don't know if it's maybe because there's less distractions on your phone and things like that. You know, your phone's not going. Or, your or brain's more. <clears throat> yeah, but like, but it's it, a but it's it, a logical thing, right? Well, th that makes sense because I, I mean I but but I'm the same way, mate. I like to to know, and if I'm if I'm unsure, I'll just go fizz. If I don't have anything when I'm, I, I'm not, I can't decide what should be first in the morning. Right, fizz. Just make it fizz, and then you know, you know, then you've got up, you've accomplished something, mm. you've done something, and then there's, I mean, there's a lot of benefits that I think fizz in the morning anyway, first thing. Um, and that's kind of, I try and, you know, kind of bookend my day a little bit with with fizz, do it first thing in the morning, um, do another one like later in the evening. And when I say fizz as well, it doesn't necessarily even, I'm not talking fashion sometimes. Fizz could just be literally, I'm just going to go for a walk. For yeah, yeah, same yeah. But something that's, something that isn't involved in sitting on my ass. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's, re <clears throat> that's really important. Um, and I just want to plug the book before I go, mate, if that's cool. Book, film, that you want to do. Book, yeah. film. Um, if anyone's interested in, um, in the book about Kabul, it's called Escape from Kabul. It's on, uh, available in hardback, uh, ebook, audio book, paperback will be out later in the year i think um and uh yeah hopefully we've done justice to the people who are there um and like i said like it, it is because people ask me like is this is this going to be ripping it apart or is this glorifying it and it's i was it's kind of a bit of both it's glorifying the people and really kind of tearing into the situation um but we're really lucky to get the interviews that we did very grateful to those people 
And um, I think when we look back at this event in in the future, I don't think it ever got the airtime it deserved because of Ukraine, because you know, it happened so soon after it that this this was kind of you know put away very quickly. Um, and that was one of the reasons we did it, mate, was because you know having been in Iraq and I've seen that happen about how how Iraq got very quickly swept in the rug. I did not want these things being lost to history because. This was a real unique moment um, from everything from the Veterans Network to what Two Para had to do and, you know, the Yorks and everyone else that was involved. You know, it was a... It's a and Free Para. Uh, sorry, mate. And, Thank you. And Free Para. Thank you. All right, created. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's uh, great to be involved with it, mate. Just really, 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 um, really honoured to be part of it. Oh, cool. Right, um... And you're going to give me a signed copy from you and Lev so I can give so my patrons... So, reference, reference signed copies. I had a bag full of them on Wednesday night. My train got cancelled, so obviously, what do you do when your train gets cancelled? Get on the lash, don't you? <laughs> I had I had something like 25 signed copies for me and Lev. I gave them away to everyone in the pub. You're joking. No, for shots. <laughs> <laughs> with Lev with you? No. What does Lev think of that marketing strategy? Um, we haven't discussed it. I'll bring it up <laughs> in the next meeting. But, fair... <laughs> Well, the thing is, mate, I was carrying this massive bag around, so it was good for my back, and it was also good for me getting lashed. So, because we came across this big group of American uh, guys, frat bros, who were on a tour, and um, I was like, oh, I've got a And it was awesome, then I didn't have to walk home with a big bag of books. But unfortunately, that meant because my mum and dad were like, Oh, do you have a copy of the book for us? No, some American frat boy has it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so if you want to get a free book off me sometimes, just find me in a pub and you. You get a free copy, so yeah. Because usually I'll bring you, usually I bring you copies of books, mate. But well, I think I do anyway. I probably don't. No, you don't. I know you don't read, so I'll buy one. I'll post it to you. You can sign it. Oh, I want to well, come. You're, you're coming come, up for Veterans yeah, Day. Yeah, I'll come Veterans State of Mind. Yeah, get signed, and then I'll uh, get a lev to sign it, and then um, I'll do a giveaway. There you go, see, mate. You know everyone involved. Get Johnny to sign it. Johnny's in there. He's got some fucking. I won't tell you what they are. I'll let you read it. But Johnny's got some brilliant quotes in there. <laughs> okay to read it uh, and MVP search online yeah you can um, the, the reviews for that are great by the way I'm not, I've not watched that either I will I'll watch it this weekend nice. or this week I try, I try not to look at reviews but occasionally I, I yeah, see look at reviews. but so, sometimes there's actually some good stuff in them um, some, sometimes you will actually but to be honest usually the stuff that they highlight is usually stuff that you picked up anyway because mm. like I said like there's always a, a lag between a product coming out and working on it there's always a lag and then usually in that time Unfortunately, it'll be things like like I fucked up and fucking um, spelled someone's name wrong in the fucking book, and like that's kind of like little things like that I've learned is like triple check, you know, like triple check name, like you know you think that you've done it, and this is just little things like that to to kind of pick up. But mate, I'm still learning on the writing. I'll be the first one to say it. I've been doing it for I think this will be year seven, but you know I mean think about it. That's like what in the military you'd be a full screw at this point. You know I've still got fucking loads loads to learn about it, but. Love it, mate. Love the job. Feel very lucky to work on this stuff. And uh, thank you to all listeners for tuning in today. Thank you for coming. Been a pleasure. And uh, good luck, mate. Cheers, bro. That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here, around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear. If not, if it's not already appeared, uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Google Podcasts, it's everywhere. It's on all of the uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of H-Hour. Becoming a patron of H-Hour, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public. And you also get access to... Uh, exclusive interviews which I do with each guest that last about five ten minutes that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of H-Hour have chosen and each guest this one included gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded it's like a pre-podcast interview lasts about 10 minutes and those interviews are really insightful really enjoyable nice and short and they only release to patrons they never get released to the public I don't know why I had a little stutter there um you also get access to a Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. 
In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away give away gifts to my Patreon supporters, and it's all like well, predominantly veteran owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran owned apparel, veteran owned product services, and I'll give them away to my Patreon supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events, so you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N. Patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q- Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.